പാർട്ടിസിപ്പൻസ് തൊണ്ണൂറ് പേരുണ്ട് തൊണ്ണൂറ് പേരുണ്ട് പാർട്ടിസിപ്പൻസ്
ओ निंदा कर सकते हैं ना अपने मत ना है तुम बात करते हो अब वो कुछ नहीं ना कितनी साधारण बात है हम्म हाँ गुड मॉर्निंग हाँ मैं निशेष
Sajid sir. Sajid sir. Ah uh, sir. We can start now sir. Okay okay. Okay. There was a technical issue in my. Please start Sajid. Start start. Yeah. Sonu. Yes sir. Okay we can start. Good morning, one and all. COVID-19, more than being a viral disorder, now it is becoming a great threat to the whole humankind, a pandemic. With the arrival of this microorganism, the end of world has been transformed into a virtual platform from the real life scenarios. As being a frontline multifaceted healthcare professional, each of the pharmacists are supposed to be a warrior who is fighting against this deadly pandemic. To serve the community with which we are committed to, we are having several weapons, including the new drug molecules, newer formulations, patient counseling or mystery precautions, and much more. This realization is the driving force for the academic wing of IPGA Kerala branch to educate the pharma community with this international webinar on the topic, Fighting Pandemic Pharmacists in the Frontline. To be brief about IPGA, the Indian Pharmacy Graduates Association, the only exclusive pharmacy professional group in India, has been contributing to the growth and development of career in pharmacy through its various branches by conducting technical seminars, awareness program, and other social activities. The association has been working for the past 40 years for the upliftment of the profession of pharmacy. It has a mission to improve the professional status of pharmacy graduates and to secure the rightful place in the healthcare sector. At present, the association has more than 7,000 life members in 21 state branches all across the country. My dearest pharmacist fraternity, let me introduce myself. I am Sonu Benny, PhD research scholar, Amruta School of Pharmacy, Amruta Vishwavidya Pidam, Cochin, Kerala. I feel blessed to be the master of this ceremony on this auspicious occasion of international webinar on fighting pandemic pharmacists in the front line organized by IPGA Kerala branch. With immense pleasure, I invite all of you to this enlightening moment. I wish a hearty welcome to all of you. First of all, I'm kindly requesting all the participants to mute your audio and to switch on your video so as to make our event more successful and interactive. Let us begin today's program by invoking the blessings of the God Almighty. I invite Ms. Adira UP, pharmacy student, Devagiyama College of Pharmacy, Malapuram, for a prayer sum. Over to you, Adira. Adida, you. Please unmute. <laughs> 
ಚ್ಯುತ ಶಂಕರ ಪ್ರಪ್ರತಿಭ ದೈ ಸದಾವಂತಿತು ಸರಸ್ವತಿ ಭಗವತಿ ನಿಶೇಷಾಪ ಬ್ರಹ್ಮ ವಿಚಾರ ಚಾರ ಪರಮ ಆಗತ್ಯಾಗತ್ಯಾಪಿಸ್ತಕಧಾರಿಣಿ ಅಭಯತ ಜಾಢ್ಯಾಂದಕಾರ ಸ್ಪಾಟಿಕಿ ಪದ್ಮಸನೆ ಸಂಸ್ಥಿತ ವೀಣಾ ಪಾದು ಸರಸ್ವತಿ ಭಗವತಿ ಬುದ್ಧಿ ಪ್ರತಾಕ್ಷಾರದ Thank you so much, Adira, for this graceful starting. Now, let's invite Dr. Sachit C.I., Vice President, IPJ Kerala State Branch, to welcome the gathering. At present, Sachit Sir is working as Professor and Vice Principal, Grace College of Pharmacy, Palakkad. He is a well-experienced academician and served as Chairman, Academic Council Member of PG Board of Studies, Kerala University, Association of Pharmacy Teachers of India, Kerala State Branch, Treasurer, Indian Pharmaceutical Association, Kerala Branch, and many more to his credit. He had a number of presentations, APG, Sonu, yes, 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 yes. you are using two mobile phones. Please switch off one. Now is it okay, sir? Yeah. Am I audible, sir? Yeah, it's yes. audible now. <laughs> now, let's invite Dr. Sajid C.I., Vice President, IPJ Kerala State Branch, to welcome the gathering. At present, Sajid sir is working as Professor... and vice principal grace college of pharmacy palakkad he is a well experienced academician who served as chairman and academic council member pg board of studies in kerala university of health sciences the member board of studies university of calicut secretary association of pharmacy teachers of india kerala state branch treasurer indian pharmaceutical association kerala branch and many more to his credit he had a number of publications presentations and also a life member of APGI, IPA and KPGA. With respect, over to you, sir. Thank you, Sonu. Good morning to one and all gathered here on this wonderful morning. Respected Chief Guest, Sri Adil Kumar Nasaji, Dr. Sadish Kumar, Jain sir, our beloved speakers, Dr. Anish Chakungal and Professor Alva Toyin, distinguished delegates, principals of various colleges, research scholars, teachers, and my dear, dear, dear students. It's my great pleasure and honor to deliver the welcome address on behalf of IPGA Kerala State Branch Academic Division at this auspicious inaugural ceremony of international webinar. I am delighted that our association organized many webinars this year. It's our common commitment to promote effective use of research and technology in diverse modes of pharmacy field. 
also it is essential to bring together the experts in the field of pharmacy so that we can realize together the potential of novel techniques of pharma research the main objective of the program is to provide a unique discussion forum on drug development and latest research technologies the webinar adopts a timely theme fighting pandemic front line it has penetrated virtually into all areas of operators of pharmacy and noted with educational practice first of all i welcome our honorable chief guest sri adil kumar nasa ji national president ipga drug controller and licensing authority new delhi thus needs no introduction he is a renowned personality among the pharma pharmacy fraternity in our country we are blessed to have his presence here today i welcome him wholeheartedly to this webinar i welcome you sir thank you thank you very much next i extend my hearty welcome our speaker dr anish chakungal principal scientist and team lead janson vaccines a johnson and johnson company netherlands we are highly privileged to have him with us in spite of his busy schedule we are grateful for your presence i welcome you sir thank you happy to be here next i take this opportunity to welcome professor alwa toin dean faculty of pharmacy university of ibadan nigeria madam accepted our invitation without a second thought personally i know that she managed to find time and attended our program for her very tight schedule we are grateful for your presence madam i welcome you thank you very much good morning it's a pleasure for me to join you thank you thank you next i extend that my hearty welcome to dr sadish kumar president ipga kerala state branch secretary jayan sir vice president renji sir executive members dr nishit dr jini and limsi tampi dr limsi tampi they are the backbone of this program i welcome all of you to this webinar to make any webinar grand success there must be good audience therefore i welcome all the viewers present here to this webinar once again i welcome each and every one thank you thank you so much sir it is always a pleasure and blessing to have this eminent personality with us today to inaugurate this function the one who is always there to support all the activities of ipga kerala branch it is none other than mr atul kumar nasa honorable national president ipga mr atul nasa sir is working as drugs controller and licensing authority new delhi and he is a member of various committees constituted by the government for framing and designing different policies he has more than 25 years of experience in regulatory affairs he is a recipient of best drugs control officer award and also fellowship of indian pharmaceutical association for his distinguished and dedicated services in the profession of pharmacy mr adil kumar nasa sir has been honored with prestigious kc chatterjee memorial award 2015 and also ipga professional excellence award 2015 he is the president of indian pharmacy graduate association and managing trustee of ipga welfare trust he has also been entrusted the role of vice president of all india drugs control offices confederation and director of indian confederation of healthcare accreditation sir has been working for the upliftment of the profession of pharmacy in the entire field at the professional and academic levels with admirable address over Nasa sir, please sir. I think some technical issues there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, can I start? Yeah, yeah. You can start. Oh, thank you, thank you. Uh, very good morning to all of you, 
and at the outset my heartiest congratulations to ipga kerala branch for successfully organizing various webinars from last you know 6 or 7 months i am watching and my special thanks to dr satish the president of ipga kerala branch i welcome dr satish dr sajit mr ranjish dr limsi thampi dr nishit dr jini dr uh, jaya shankar shekhar other i am seeing 135 plus participant on this sunday morning to this international webinar being organized by ipga kela branch and this ipga kela branch webinar based on the topic fight type fighting pandemic the role of pharmacist as a frontline warrior this is the theme of the you know needy conference which is required particularly during this pandemic time my introduction sonu has given that i am working as a drugs controller and licensing authority with drugs control department delhi but simply i can say i am a pharmacist and my journey right from pharmaceutical industry to academic and then to drug control whether it is a academic pharmacist or a industrial pharmacist or a regulatory pharmacist i can simply say i am a pharmacist and during this pandemic time we have seen that in 1918 when the spanish flu was there in 1956 when asian flu was there then we have seen the pandemic of hiv aids in 2005 and then so on but simply i can say pandemic may come it is not a you know big you know threat but we have to work unitedly to fight all this pandemic and here is the role of pharmacist pharmacists play a very important role between physician and the patient there are three p's one is physician other is pharmacist and other is the patient and out of these three p's pharmacist is in the middle one so i can say pharmacist is carbon carbon double bond between physician and the patient a whole question comes on the theme of the conference that research and development role of pharmacist in research and development role of pharmacist in developing new drug molecule role of pharmacist in hospital pharmacy role of pharmacist in community pharmacy role of pharmacist in clinical pharmacy everyone everyone is playing a very important role so pharmacists are the front line warrior particularly for this pandemic for the covid 19 treatment we have seen so many challenges from last you know 18 months last year march 2020 and till date first wave second wave and maybe maybe third wave i i will i will not say that third wave should come i will never wish that third wave should come but we have to be mentally prepared for all you know consequences if such circumstances are there hand sanitizers ppe kits sqs tablets remdesivir injections toslizumab injections and of course very difficult situation of black fungus amphotericin b injection all they were a big challenges among the pharmaceutical industry among the pharmacists among the clinicians among the medical professionals but we got the success we planned the situation in such a way that everybody should be you know given comfortable site so that there should not be any threat to covid 19 or pandemic pharmacists are playing a very important role in proper patient counseling proper patient guidance avoiding self medications avoiding drug addictions prevention of antimicrobial resistance development of new drug molecules and of course working in research and development sections when this pandemic was there 
covid 19 challenge was there every entire country was looking after vaccines my salute to all pharmacists working in pharmaceutical industry particularly in research and development sections and in production department of a pharmaceutical company that we got success of getting the covaxin and covishield and other related products in our country so we are on the safer side but this is not the end we have to see from future prospects we have to plan in such a way that in the coming time in the future time there should not be any problem to any you know uh, community or any particular individual so here whether a pharmacist working in r and d sections whether a pharmacist working in quality control department whether a pharmacist working in quality assurance department pharmacist working in production department pharmacists working in different spheres of pharmaceutical fields they have to play an important role and they are playing an important role the record says so this is the role of pharmacist but only thing what we have to understand that we should not wait for any other pandemic or any new situation to come our research and development section should be strong enough we have to go for extreme in depth research for developing a new molecule new drug we should not wait for any pandemic to come and we should be mentally prepared that we have to fight for any such situation in a very comfortable way i will not take much time i am very happy to see two international speakers for this today webinar dr anish who is speaking on role of pharmacists in developing versatile anti pandemic vaccines very important topic He is from Netherlands. I welcome Dr. Anish from Netherlands, who is going to deliver a very excellent talk. And other speaker of the day, Professor Alibertian from the University of Ibadan, Nigeria, and she is going to speak on pharmacist role in vaccination lesson from pandemic COVID-19. So both topics of Dr. Anish and Professor Alibertian are very relevant topics on the today's pandemic situation. and i hope whatever the presentation dr anish and dr professor alivetan are going to give they will be definitely helpful to all the participating delegates all the participating professionals in today's webinars with these remarks i congratulate ipg kerala branch and entire team for conducting regular these webinars for the profession of pharmacy for the young scientists for the young students for the academicians and for everyone who is related to the pharmacy profession and good news for now sonu and everyone now you cannot say mr atul kumar nasa now i have completed my doctorate in pharmacy oh nice so, yeah so recently i have been awarded my phd degree and uh, now you can <laughs> amend my qualification or my name as dr atul kumar nasa and my topic was on counterfeit medicines which is a oh. big challenge thank you thank you so, Uh, thank you very much because you know counterfeit medicine in the entire world is a big threat to the entire pharmaceutical industry so i thought let us take this topic and work on in depth how to prevent counterfeiting of drugs in our country and also in a seeing the global situation how we can solve this problem so recently i have been awarded this degree from mit university noida and i took my admission in 2015 and got my degree just in the last month in august 2021 so my best wishes to each and every one and i am very happy with the ipj kela branch with a small span of time small span of time dr satish dr sajit all you know executive council member they are working very hard by conducting so many good webinars and particularly on sunday i am seeing 135 plus participation in this webinar this is good attendance so my congratulations to all of you and with best wishes to each and every one thank you very much thank you so much yeah how to sorry you have to unmute sorry you have to unmute sonu then talk can mute now okay yeah 
Thank you so much, Dr. Adil Kumar Nasasar, for your valuable words and the constant support for the IPG Kerala branch always. So no, one minute. Uh, we will have next time. We will have him for as a speaker for our uh, counterfeit uh, products, drugs. Like next time, next time, sir. Definitely, definitely, I can give an excellent talk on counterfeiting medicine. Yeah, which is a good topic for the entire you know pharmacy profession. Yes, make it. Thank you. Thank you so Thank much, you. sir. Thank you. And I'm and I'm, I'm apologizing all of you for the technical failures from my side. My side. So now here we are moving to the most awaited hours to the brainstorming moments. Yes, we are about to start our webinar. If you have any doubts or queries during the session, all of you are kindly requested to post your questions in the chat box and it will be discussed at the end of the session. All the participants will be provided with e-certificate and the link for the same will be shared in the end of the second scientific session. So we are begin with the first session of the day. We are so blessed to have Dr. Anish Chekangal, Principal Scientist and Team Lead, Janssen Vaccines, Netherlands, to throw a light onto the topic, role of pharmacists in developing versatile anti-pandemic vaccines. On this occasion, it is my pleasure to invite Mr. Ranjit C, Vice President, IPG Kerala State Branch, to introduce our first speaker of the day. At present, Ranjit Sir is working as Assistant Professor, College of Pharmaceutical Sciences, Government Medical College, Alapura. He completed his graduation from Department of Pharmaceutical Sciences, MG University, Kottayam, and post-graduation from College of Pharmaceutical Sciences, Government Medical College, Trivandrum. He started his career as Enforcement Officer in Drugs Control Department, Government of Kerala, and later joined on the Medical Education Service. With much respect, over to you, sir. Thank you, Zono. Am I audible? Yes, sir. You are audible, sir. Okay. Good morning, all. Respected chief guest, speakers, my dear teachers, students, and other honorable pharmacists who have joined us today morning, a warm welcome to one and all present here. This webinar, Fighting Pandemic, Pharmacist in the Friend Line, is being organized to bring forward the remarkable roles being played by we, the pharmacist, in fighting this COVID pandemic. The topic of this session is role of pharmacists in developing anti-pandemic vaccines. The speaker for this session is Dr. Anish Chakumal, Principal Scientist and Team Lead, Analytical Development and Bioconjugation, Janssen Vaccines, a subsidiary of Johnson & Johnson, Netherlands. The whole world is reeling under the pandemic. It has already caused the loss of hundreds of thousands of lives and disrupted the livelihoods of billions of people around the world. With the reporting of Delta variant in more than 96 countries, it is said that no one is safe unless everyone is safe. Developing a vaccine against COVID-19 is the most challenging task. As we all are aware that there is no promising antiviral drug that can effectively cure this disease. Then the only option available to save millions of lives is to vaccinate. To throw light on this challenging process of vaccine development in this time of pandemic, we are fortunate to have with us today an ambitious pharmaceutical technologist, Dr. Anish Chakumkal, who will be giving us an overview on versatile vaccine platforms that are already available and also that are under development for controlling the pandemic. His talk will highlight the limitations of the platforms, opportunities and challenges, and also about the expectations on the efficacy of the currently available vaccines against various variants of the virus. And of course, he will also cover the areas where pharmacists can contribute in vaccine development. Coming to his academic background, Dr. Anish, did his BPharm from Department of Pharmaceutical Sciences, MG University, Kottayam, and his master's MPharm from University Institute of Chemical Technology, formerly UDCT, Mumbai University, and completed his PhD in 2010 from the prestigious National Institute of Immunology, New Delhi. He has also received training in flawless executions of projects, effective first-time leader training, GMP, GMP documentation training, etc. His professional 
life started as uh, started in 2002 as senior lecturer at College of Pharmaceutical Sciences, Government Medical College, Kodikot, Kerala. He spent there for two years, and from there he went to National Institute of Immunology, New Delhi, for his PhD. Then, in 2011, he moved to Max Planck Institute of Colloids and Interfaces, Berlin, as a postdoctoral fellow and worked on synthetic vaccines. Later on. He worked as a research group leader in the Department of Biomolecular Systems in the same Max Planck Institute. In September 2014, he joined in the Bacterial Vaccines Department of Janssen Vaccines and Prevention, Netherlands, as Senior Scientist and Scientific Team Lead. And in April 2019, he was promoted as Principal Scientist and Scientific Team Lead. He has expertise in various domains of pharmaceutical industry and has over nine years of experience in leading multidisciplinary project teams. His main area of interest is vaccine development. He's having a solid background in biotech product development with a focus on characterization of APIs and compounded formulation. Currently, he's managing two biotech product development projects and also coordinates three transnational CROs and Janssen vaccines. His key achievements, there are quite a lot, and just to list a few of them, he has contributed to more than 130 international patents, including European and US patent, and has more than 40 plus peer-reviewed publications. He has published in almost all high-impact publication groups like Nature, Elsevier, Science, Royal Society, American Chemical Society, etc. And he has been awarded with many honors. He was awarded the Janssen Global R&D Award for Outstanding Technical Achievement in the year 2016. He is a recipient of BMBF Germany Budding Scientist Grant in 2011 and also Max Planck Postdoctoral Fellowship 2010. He was the best outgoing student from MG University in the year 2001 and so on. He has received many, many uh, awards and honors. I know him right from the college days and watched him grow in his academic and professional life. And I always see him as an enthusiastic, hardworking, down-to-earth all-rounder. With this introduction, I once again welcome Dr. Anish. We are eagerly waiting to hear from you. Uh, before starting, one minute, let me once again request all the participants to keep their mics muted. Dr. Anish will be very happy to answer all your queries. Please post your questions in the chat box. We shall be reading your questions at the end of the session. So that's it. Over to you, Anish. Welcome. Good morning, everyone. Uh, am I audible? Yes, yeah, good morning. Audible. Okay, great. Thank you. It's a great day. Nice to meet you all. And thank you, uh, uh, Renjish. Renjish. I call him Renjish Ayatan because he was my senior at school uh, in, 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 uh, in college. It's a great moment. Um, great moment that I've been introduced by Renji Shet, and it's a great moment to be with all the uh, pharmacists from India, especially from Kerala. I must say, I uh, I really resonate the message that uh, Dr. Abdul Kumar Nasa I mean, conveyed to us. The IPGA um, Kerala chapter is doing an excellent job. Uh, I was with them within uh, one meeting where they invited me for the preparation of this uh, particular seminar, I could feel, I could sense this enthusiasm, drive and motivation behind the organizing committee. Uh, we need someone like that. We need this kind of an um, initiative. It was definitely, it is one of the most difficult day for me, a Sunday morning, seven o'clock. And uh, especially at this moment, I was down with an, a nasty fever for the last three, four days. I couldn't do anything, but I managed to do something in the overnight. And I studied at, I think at 12 o'clock only, 12.30 or one o'clock or something, I finished my work. But I was asking this question to myself, why do you do this? Okay, and even my family asked this, why do you do this? The only answer is that I could see the motivation drive and you know, uh, the hard work that people are putting behind to, to, to uh, bring people uh, together. You know, that's a great feeling. And I, I, first of all, let me start my presentation with these salutes to the, each and everyone who worked behind it, um, Sajid Sar, uh, Nishi Sar, um, and the entire committee, I don't know all of them, uh, but great job, great work. And also, all these 135 people who managed to join on a Sunday, it's a great thing. So, um, having 
having introduced myself, I mean, it, I'm, I'm feeling humbled because it was a bit elaborate uh, introduction. The topic today I will be talking is all about vaccines, 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 vaccines. The most important question I ask before starting my preparation of this presentation is that why should I, what should I talk? What should I, what, what, what level I should keep my messages? Shall I go very deep into explaining the mechanisms we get all the vaccines? Shall I talk a lot of science behind it? Then I realize, okay, maybe that is not the most relevant thing. Maybe I should highlight uh, the opportunities, highlight the, um, the uh, challenges existing with the uh, different uh, platforms. Maybe I should, you know, create some spark in the ignited minds of people who are looking forward to understand more about this vaccine. So my talk will be at really a high level, but if you have any questions, I am happy to make a deep dive and explain you how things are working. So no more mechanistic talks, but mostly on the high level about what are the different vaccine options, what are the different platforms, how these um, uh, vaccines are made, what are the challenges in making them? What are the challenges in bringing them to the patient? And how a pharmacist can make a role or play a role? And also how a pharmacist can uh, join hands with the other professionals in designing a better vaccine. So that would be my kind of an highlight of my talk. Okay. Having said that, let me try to present my uh, presentation. Can everyone see my presentation now? Oh, I haven't started sharing it. Sorry, one moment. Let me go back. Can everyone see my? Uh... Yes, yes, we can see. Yes, we can. We can. We can. Okay. So, as uh, Ranjish mentioned, I'll be presenting you on the role of pharmacists in developing versatile pandemic vaccines. I'm currently working for Johnson & Johnson uh, as a head of adjuvants and vaccine delivery systems in the Netherlands, the Global r and Center for Vaccine Development for Johnson & Johnson. Having said this, I would like to give a cautionary note. I'm not trying to, um, I will not be highlighting many of the things what we do at Johnson & Johnson and uh, many things I'm sharing is my personal opinion. It's my personal opinion as a researcher, as a scientist, as an a vaccine development uh, technologies. It's not an opinion of Johnson Johnson. That's why I'm also not using uh, the uh, logo of Johnson Johnson, okay? Just for uh, clarity. So the goal of the presentation is, what is in scope? I just want to generate interest and motivation among emerging professionals who are the field of vaccinology. So what is what is field of vaccinology? What's the science behind developing vaccines? What's really out of scope is, the presentation is not a single stop ready recognized for vaccines. You don't get everything. You don't, it's not an encyclopedia of vaccines. It's not a ticket to a destination, rather a keyword for journey planning. So you, I'll create, I'll, I'll share some keywords which you can search and elaborate your knowledge. That's the idea of the presentation. So what I'm going to present is that I'll present the concept of vaccination, the concept of herd immunity, how vaccines work, what are the different types of anti-pandemic vaccines, Towards the end, I'll try to highlight the role of pharmacists in developing an anti-COVID vaccine. I'll start with a, a story or a myth, okay? It's an interesting, just to make a lighter moment, Sunday morning, I'm coming. I'm from Netherlands. And the moment I landed in Netherlands, even before coming to Netherlands, I think even when I was in Kerala, I read about the, a, a, a myth, a myth of protection from Netherlands. And the story is about an, a little Dutch boy and a dyke. As you, many of you know, Netherlands is like, like a Kutunard is a low lying, Netherlands means low lying land, okay? It is almost 60%, 48% of the country is beneath the or under the sea level. So that's they are protected with big dikes. The dikes or dams, dikes are protecting the entire land. There's a story that once in a countryside, a boy, a little boy was walking and he found a crack, a small hole in the dike. And he actually put his, poke his finger, put, uh, put his finger over there and stayed there for hours till you know, uh, I'm, I'm blocking this, this leakage and he saved the entire country. This kind of a myth, this myth of protection is actually, it's actually a myth. It never happened, but it's a kind of a little fable, which is everybody's sharing in every moment. So we all think that the protection that we are seeking from a vaccine, is kind of mythical. If you think, okay, protects means 
something, an extraordinary force will come and uh, protect us. We also expect that a vaccine is a magic portion, eh? something which, which, which we can drink or which we can have a jab that will protect us from everything. I'm trying to bust those things. I'm trying to give you some scientific rationale how these vaccines work and how they may not work. That may give you a kind of better picture to understand, okay, uh, which vaccine may work for us, which vaccine may not work for me. And also uh, after taking a vaccine, how responsible I should be or why I should take a vaccine. Those kind of questions, uh, those kind of bustling questions which may come to your mind, you know, you will, you may be able to answer them. So why I'm saying this is a myth, this is a myth which dr drives everybody in the Netherlands. But the reality, how Netherlands is protected, because the re real reality is really much more complex. In the pre, before all the, the machine age, they actually protected the entire Netherlands by using these beautiful windmills, which were pumping water from the land to sea, okay? So they use these primitive windmills, which are all still we can see around this country, this beautiful country. But nowadays they don't even use that. They use this, this kind of, you know, this kind of mass, mass land catering, one of the largest sea gate of the world, and which actually automatically senses water level and closes and uh, uh, opens, and which is the largest moving object on the earth, man-made object on the earth. So these kind of very complex engineering solutions, which is which were made by ages of calculation, understanding the weather, understanding the sea level, understanding the uh, mechanics behind that, this kind of complex machineries helps helped us to protect the entire uh, Netherlands. The same story is also applicable to vaccines. When we started vaccines, we had a kind of an, you know, this our uh, Hanumanji's mind, delivering the whole thing to the whole to the patient. We were talk whole cell vaccine, the real pathogen itself was a vaccine. If it's a virus, we culture the virus. For example, polio vaccine, we culture the polio vaccine. Or if it's TB vaccine, we culture the uh, mycobacterium. So the real bacterium or the microbe behind the disease were delivered. And that's why it created all those uh, nasty uh, side effects. And also sometimes we had soreness, sometimes we had pustules forming on your on your arm, all those kind of things. But the molecular understanding about host pathogen interactions, molecular understanding about uh, how our immune system was working has helped us to develop subunit vaccines. Subunit vaccines like Achilles heat, like Achilles feet, we could identify the sweet spot, the most sensitive spot, the most susceptible spot on the bacteria, which can be molecule, which can be part of the molecule. We realize that this is a target which we need to hit. So that led to these modern vaccines. And this development happened probably last uh, 20, 30 years or 20, 20, 25 years. But still, if you look even today, not everybody has transformed completely into these molecular vaccines. Even the COVID vaccines, some of the vaccines are pathogen based, completely virus based. So uh, the transition is yet to happen, but we are now on a kind of an, um, a kind of an, uh, critical juncture point. People are evaluating different technologies, different technologies are available to different uh, countries. So I expect in the, next generation vaccine which are going to come which would be a bit more modern and the question that we are asking today is that are we prepared for that are we it means as pharmacists what can a pharmacist do to catch up with this revolution of modern vaccines so and this answer is this field of vaccinology molecular understanding about pathogens what causes the disease what doesn't cause a disease what are the different molecules which are present on the surface of an uh, bacterium or an, um, or, an, or an virus, which actually drives an immune response. How can we Im invite the attention of immune response or the immune system towards a vaccine target that we are delivering? When I say the word delivering, how can we deliver it? Okay, so these are, this is this combined, this combined field, it's an interdisciplinary field, is known as vaccinology. Designing the molecules, identifying molecules, designing molecules, synthesizing molecules, packaging them and delivering them into patients. And this field is vaccinology. And that's a multidisciplinary field where biotechnologists, molecular biologists, immunologists, pharmacists, clinicians, all of them play together. And I'll be giving you a, a bit of gist of this particular field. 
before we start i would like to start with an i just i will take you back to 60 years ago or 70 years ago in 1950s the launch of polio vaccine polio was a real real threat at those times even the american president franklin roosevelt had the fda at that even his um, kids had it it was a real nightmare for many of the american uh, summers everybody was is like current pandemic situation everybody wanted a vaccine everybody was looking for a vaccine and this this gentleman jonas salk he even administered the vaccine that he developed to his kid his own daughter when he developed the vaccine the entire us you know they they actually stopped all churches stopped to honor him all churches stopped the mass they, uh, all the uh, bars uh, offered a special drink whenever wherever he go, we, he went he was a celebrity because he transformed the life of people he prevented that he prevented um, you know handi- people getting handicapped and he was a revolutionary because what he developed was that he developed a mechanism how to grow a virus and how to inactivate using a simple technique by using formaldehyde inactivation i'm not talking this story to just to honor him but i also want to highlight why manufacturing technology is relevant and how it impacts the further decision of an the vaccine though yona salk developed one of the most efficient he had 80 87% eff- efficacy or um, uh, yeah, effectiveness for the vaccine the manufacturing was really i would say it's inconsistent manufacturing was tricky let's call it that okay since he developed the vaccine the us government and just showing a story sharing an important story that will be a kind of launch part for the rest of the story and where pharmacists can play an important role when he developed the vaccine the entire us government was so enthusiastic because fdr was a president even it is said that he he went and declared this news the fdr broke up because such an emotional moment for them the government became enthusiastic government gave license to five different um, pharmaceutical major pharmaceutical companies to manufacture the vaccine one of the pharmaceutical company was a new pharmaceutical company which is one of the cutters by a family firm and they got the license and the vaccine was manufactured by dress everywhere everywhere rightly but the vaccine manufactured by these cutters that because the vaccine was an inactivated vaccine they grow live really real pathogen and they inactivated with formaldehyde but this inactivation process didn't go very well in the uh, in, in cutters and the vaccine people who received vaccine from cutters only with cutters okay this is not a cutters incident actually they started paralyzing because they got polio and a lot of community outbreaks of polio happen in places where this vaccine was evaluated, uh, injected that actually casted a negative image on the salk vaccine that gave an opportunity for a sabin vaccine which is a oral polio vaccine that we all use in india and why we all use in india this uh, polio vaccine because people know salk vaccine is more effective but we all went with sabin vaccine because that image of cutters incident that is a tricky vaccine to manufacture or even in advanced country like america and talking 1950 was difficult such an incident can happen they were not mentally prepared to go in developing nations under developed nations with an, uh, such a vaccine because it is a really potent uh, really a fatal disease if somebody gets it through vaccination but the oral polio vaccine has more danger because we are giving a live attenuated vaccine over there the chance of you know escaping the uh, attenuation is a bit higher and people getting vaccine induced poliomyelitis is a bit higher than the uh, salk vaccine but this manufacturing defect or the poor managing of the manufacturing has led to this casting this image and many people and still that image is is is, is um you know is uh, casting that part kind of an, a negative shadow and only in the last year or, or four years ago who realized it who is now expanding this possibility to make the polio vaccine in a better fashion and it is there's a new project also happening throughout different parts of the world so i'm just highlighting this because how a vaccine is is not an ipad there's a difference between ipad and a vaccine both maybe having both complex, same complexities in manufacturing the, the advantage of an ipad or a mobile phone is that after making an ipad or mobile phone through complex manufacturing schemes the person who is releasing it for human use can switch on the ipad and test whether it's working all components can be tested before releasing to humanity or human uh, to human society 
but a vaccine is not like that. Once a vaccine is manufactured in a manufacturing filling line, the entire vial goes out without testing. If we do a lot of testing, physical chemical testing, but we don't, we cannot test in, in another human whether it's working or not. That's why in the case of vaccine, it is not just a product important, the process. A vaccine is a process more than a product. The quality of the product is, it's a, the, pro, the product and process in the case of vaccine are really a conjoined twins. They, are, they should be taken together, learned together, observed together. And if manufacturing is so important, manufacturing is the area of pharmaceutical scientists. I don't think pharmaceutical manufacturing, nobody else can claim over there. That is why pharmacists is so key to the development of better vaccines. I think this actually, this is this whole story and this whole message set the stage for my discussion. I would like to share a bit of thoughts of herd immunity. What's a herd immunity means? Probably many of you know, herd immunity means this is like this. If, if in the first scenario, then if nobody is vaccinated, if a virus comes over there, almost everybody, all reds, reds are infected people, blue are healthy people, almost everybody will get a uh, infection. It's the most dangerous situation, probably the situation of uh, all of us, the world in January 2020 or March 2020. When some of us are, like yellows are um, um, vaccinated, when some of us are vaccinated, still the, the chance probably now like the situation of Kerala now, maybe 30%, 40% immunized. So still the chance of many people getting, that's where the test positive positive rates are very really high. But the moment we go into more in the yellow zones, okay, the yellow zones means more, more than 80% of people are vaccinated. Then the possibility of the vaccine, the, 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 the microbe penetrating the, the community is very less. Even the non-vaccinated people are also protected because the virus, if the virus jump, cannot jump from one person to other person, so even a non-vaccinated person will be protected. And there are people who cannot be vaccinated transferred. That is why, but if you want to achieve a herd immunity, we would like to hit very high vaccination rates. And this also unfortunately have not happened because people are, some of, some people are really resisting without understanding the story of the concept behind the vaccination. So the herd, our whole idea is to reach this herd immunity. Herd immunity is that, okay, me being responsible and being, getting vaccinated, I, I protect myself at the same time. I also try to protect someone who's also not vaccinated, someone who's near to me in my family where someone who may not be producing an effective response due to some comorbidities, due to some genetic defect, defects and et cetera, et cetera. So it is my it's responsibility to the community, to the society to get vaccinated, to protect myself, as well as to protect my own near ones. That's the whole concept of herd immunity. These are not big pep talks. This is real a reality. I just want to give some numbers. Numbers helps us to understand. Vaccines really saves life. Vaccine is the second means invented by humans after the pot, clean potable water actually transformed the human life. Okay, if you look the numbers of few of the most important vaccines available or the diseases available uh, which were present and the uh, vaccines available against that, it actually gives you a good idea about the number of cases. Looks smallpox, twenty nine thousand per year to zero is completely uh, disappeared. And if you don't need to go so back, I mean, the former uh, chief minister, of, I always say, say these stories. Once somebody asked this uh, former chief minister of Kerala, we are such as and then he's a living person now among us, am I right? Why don't you believe in God? And he said a story. I don't believe in God because when I was young, at four or five years, somebody asked me, where is my mother? And I asked someone, where is my mother? He's, somebody showed to a small hut in the corner of his house where his mother was quarantining due to Wazuri or smallpox. He never met his mother. So it's not a long story. Smallpox was among us 100 years ago, not even 100 years ago, 90 years ago, or 84 years ago. Now it's zero. Diphtheria, common case, rubella, tetanus, polio. And as I said, even, even American person in the 1950s, he had a polio. So we are talking about really how vaccines affect. Vaccines helps, but unfortunately we cannot see it, okay? And that is also one of the main problems. Now, if you look, the vaccine hesitancy or the people's, people who are, don't want to take vaccine doesn't happen in, 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 in poor countries. It happened even in rich countries. In Seattle, one of the affluent places of uh, the world, Seattle in the US, cases of whooping cough or you know, uh, pertussis happens. 
a nice vaccine exists over there because people have never seen pertussis now. The new generation, so they think pertussis doesn't exist. And they want the, when the kids die, then only they realize. And quite recently, there's a situation of a French couple who went to Peru because they, they went there without vaccinating against measles. And in the, in the airport, they found this couple had, that kid had measles and these French citizens were not allowed to enter Peru and they felt very bad. Oh, Peru holding me back from entering them because they were not vaccinated. And there was an outbreak of measles in France this uh, the, uh, three years ago. The story I'm trying to say that just like even after availability of these life-saving vaccines, many people don't take it. It's unfortunate, but it's really work. Vaccine works, it saves life, it's one of the best means of protecting your new ones. I would like to just share you a big picture how these vaccines are made. I don't want to, I, I will share this link. I request everybody to review it, but I would like to share you a small video that gives you a good picture about how these uh, vaccines are made. It's better than a big talk from my side. Can everyone hear my audio audio as well? Audio audible, Manish. Is audible? Physical audible. Okay, thank you. Yes, you're audible. Are you playing in a video? Yeah. Video is can not. this video is audible? I no. I can see. No, no, video is not there. Okay, no problem. Okay. I'll 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 just uh, go through that then. So okay, I recommend everyone to go and have a look on this a very nice video from Nature Vaccines about how vaccines are developed, okay? And that goes like this, when we get a bacteria, we are first identifying. So what we do is, once we have virus, we look into a virus or a pathogen or anything, we look into the surface molecules. Why surface molecules are quite important? Because surface molecules are the most exposed one, the most exposed one, the most important target. So they, we can look into the surface molecules and identify the molecules over there and try to, in the case of this COVID vaccine, we tried for the spike protein, which is actually the spike as a burning in price, which spikes out of the virus. And then, the most important thing is that in some pathogens, this particular structure is always, or this we call conserved antigen. The surface molecule is always conserved. But virus is a great example. In virus, if they're so smart, they keep on changing surface molecules so that they can evade the immune system. So that's what we call these mutations. Mutation means they change the surface molecule. When they change the surface molecules, they can escape the immune system. So this is also an art of understanding which is the most conserved structure and how this structure has been um, maintained throughout generations of vaccines. And if they change, that's a structural understanding. If they change, we can also understand what's called mutation hotspots. If you analyze a sequence of millions of viruses in the globe using bioinformatic tools, that's why the keyword is bioinformatics. If you know how to use protein sequences or analyze protein sequences using computers, which is which has also evolved last 10, 15 years, the computer algorithms or computational tools, which allows us to just put stacks like, you know, parallelly one after one after one, the sequence of uh, the uh, protein structures of a uh, virus, then we can see where are the spots where this, this um, virus or a bacterium is always changing its uh, structure. And they're known as mutational hotspots. And if you know these hotspots, we may be able to predict because now there are artificial intelligence tools as well as algorithms. We may be able to predict what would be the next change coming, okay? And then when, when, while designing a vaccine, we can include those potential changes also. And sometimes we, we may be able to, uh, you know, even introduce uh, in our structure uh, some 
uh, artificial uh, amino acids or artificial structures or artificial mutations so that it also accounts for a future uh, upcoming uh, mutation as well. So that's why this molecular understanding is quite, quite important. And the uh, bioinformatic tools or, uh, I mean, computational tools for protein analysis is now where it's very easily trainable. You guys, all, all of us can, these are available in the internet. There's nice uh, tools over there. Many of them are free as well. That's also a nice skill to uh, pick up. So what we happen is that once we know the structure, we actually package them into a, a vector. It can be a viral vector. It can be, an, in the case of an uh, mRNA, it can be into a nanoparticles and different, different things. This is not the most important thing. The most important thing is that once the vaccine is made, or once the molecule is made, we test them into different, we test them into different animal, uh, animal models. And uh, having an, a right animal model is the most important thing because um, it should actually connect to the human things, okay? For example, in the case of a flu vaccine, we test in ferrets. In some of the cases, for the example, case of staph aureus vaccines, we test in mini pigs. In some cases, we test in um, rats. So the knowledge about which is a right animal model for testing a vaccine is also very important, something very close to people who work on in vivo, in vitro uh, pharmacological models. So this animal experiments and to set up a clinical model, which is equivalent to human setting is also a very important part of the vaccinology. And once the uh, preclinical testing is done, we really go into human testing. And why this human testing is quite important? Human testing is important because it has three different stages. We test for this, uh, safety in the phase one stage, then we test for phase two in, in elaborated uh, safety testing. And towards the end, we do phase three, which is the phase efficacy in really in community, people get vaccinated and go and live in the community. We can test whether people get the vaccine or say the infection or not. So these are the different stages of vaccine development. And having said this, this is also not an easy task because who should be vaccinated in the phase one? How do we select the patients? What is the what kind of immune system exists in them? What kind of immune uh, um, inheritance they have? Do they have any immune deficiency? And what kind of lifestyle they have? And where can we organize a, 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 a trial? What are the legislations behind it? And what kind of facilities available over there? For example, depending upon the vaccine, for a simple example, if you want to, uh, when they start with this mRNA vaccine, which needs to be stored at minus 70, minus 65, many clinics in the globe didn't have, never had a deep freezer. So the entire logistics of managing a clinical trial is also a very important part, a place where a, a pharmacist can actually play a role. There are many pharmacists who works over there. So we go to phase one, phase two, actually wanted, and then go to the phase four that is after vaccine is launched. So basically, And this, this is the most important part there. Pharmacist plays an important role. The, the entire development usually should five to six years or seven to, eight, seven to eight years. But in the COVID vaccination period, everything could be compressed into 12 to 18 months. That's a great thing. Why we managed to make 12 to eight months? Did we cut and cut short any methods? That's something also we, we can have a discussion about. No, this is because we actually speed up manufacturing, we speed up a regulatory process. And what is this regulatory process? Also something that's very important. We, we may have to have a, a short discussion about. But before going over there, I would like to give you one hint. The most important aspect where pharmacists plays a key role is manufacturing of the vaccines. What could be uh, the vial? Which excuse, kind of vial? Excuse me, Anish. Are you move, your, your slide is not moving, it seems. Oh, it's not moving. Sonu, can you, is it moving? Nishit? No, sir, it's not moving. It's not moving. It's not moving. Yeah, I learned okay, from then I did a, uh, okay, sorry, then I'll go back to my slide, sorry, then I will just close it, I will, I will share this to you, I don't think I can play a video, I will just go back to my presentation, okay, off, leave it, I thought I, uh, this is a technological problem, sorry, I'll go back to my presentation then, I'll share this link, I request all of you to go and um, watch, it's a very a nice video, self-explanatory, that gives you a better picture about how vaccines are made, I thought that may help in my discussion later. Okay, I'll leave it. I directly go into the different coronavirus vaccine candidates. As I, as I said, 
there are different platforms available. And these platforms are made for some reasons. And uh, how they've evolved. So as I said, some of the vaccines which are available currently in the market are, or currently licensed are really pure vaccine based, a pure, uh, pure uh, virus based. What, why is it pure virus based? Because they, what, do, what do they do is they go to the clinic, isolate a virus from a, uh, from a patient, they grow in, in a mammalian cell, the way the uh, virus grows in, 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 our, in, our, in our body, they grow in a mammalian cell within a uh, bioreactor, and then they inactivate it, either they attenuate it by multiple passage or they inactivate it using a chemical treatment, and then they package and formulate and they deliver it. And that's known as whole cell vaccines. Classical example is a covaxin is an example, or Sinovac is an example. Then uh, there's something called a viral vectors, a viral vector vaccine since they are using another virus and not a, a kind of an, a, a naive virus, a virus which cannot um, infect us, which is not, for example, an adenovirus fact, a platform. COVID shield is a great example, or Janssen vaccine is a great example. What they do is they isolate, they, they isolate the chemical, or synthesize the, the genetic information, which is important for producing this spike protein. And then they clone it, they insert it into the, gen uh, the nucleic acid sequence of a vector. A vector is a carrier, it's a dummy, dummy, it just carries it. And why um, that's an interesting uh, technology, we can, we can go over there and discuss a bit about that. Another important uh, category uh, is uh, protein based. It's really only the protein part has been isolated. The protein part has also been uh, used. There's something called um, wireless, wireless select particle where this protein is also packaged into a kind of a liposomal structure. That's also an, another, another category. So the Novavax vaccine, which recently got uh, uh, approved, is a protein based vaccine. And uh, we also have um, nucleic acid based vaccine, which is really the Pfizer vaccine and Moderna vaccine is one of one of them is this uh, lipid uh, nanoparticle package mRNAs, uh, both Pfizer as well as Moderna, which where only the, this nucleic acid element is being uh, delivered. And there's another important class in us DNA vaccines, for example, Cytos Cadilla, uh, Cytos, uh, oh, sorry, no, Cytos, the Cadilla, the Cadilla from India has world's first uh, DNA vaccine for COVID already uh, um, submitted for emergency approval. So there are different class, the entire class of vaccines, and a class of um, molecules have been tested for COVID vaccines. Let's have a look of one by one, what are the advantages, how everybody is expected to work, and uh, is there a difference between them in efficacy, this kind of things. So a viral vector uses a harmless virus, which is altered to contain a part of COVID's genetic code. That is viral vector, the Janssen vaccine or COVID shield is a very good example. An RNA nucleic acid, a nucleic acid structure, which is which, which comprises the genetic information of the RNA, but it's not the exact nucleic acid of the RNA, okay? A synthetically modified, chemically synthesized nucleic acid. Really, the real nucleic acid has been used as an RNA, RNA vaccine. And also, it's in the same, that's the same story of the DNA vaccine as well. Horsel virus, I already explained, protein, protein supplement, I already explained. So, if you take an a metaphor is like different colored footballs. All of them are different, but they all do the same thing. They all have the same. All of them are efficacious. All of the all of them do the same thing. But there is a difference how they look, how they are manufactured. So they are designed to do same to shoot at the goal. But they have some different shapes, different logistics, different kinetics. So if you can, these these things come come from American football. These come from normal soccer. All of them are footballs, but the way they move. The, the effort involved in bringing them into the uh, target is different. The same story is also about the way it's manufactured, the way the, the pain involved, the steps involved, the complexities involved in making a whole cell virus versus a viral vector is different. I'll try to shed some uh, light on this thing, try to sh share some stories about that as well. So that now more than that, they also differ in their, their um, potency. For example, uh, the, vi the virus from RNA-based uh, vaccines, the, the, the vaccine based from RNA-based vaccine, they need two shots, but they are quite unstable. They cannot be stored at 2 to 8 degree normal freeze. They need to be stored at minus 8, minus 70 degrees, okay? Or in the case of Moderna, minus 20 degrees. Uh, these are, they have been licensed, sorry for that. 
in the case of i mean but there's no other uh, licensed vaccines available i think there's one one licensed vaccine uh, one recently got for a for an um, minor uh, uh, cancer situations but otherwise the two major vaccines which got licensed using this platform is this covid vaccines viral vector uh, vector ebola vaccine from gsk is in the same platform and also the johnson johnson is the same platform but that works with one dose in the case of janssen it gives two dose in the case of Os oxford but all these vaccines viral vaccine horse virus and protein they all can be kept in 2 to 8 degree this and two and that's why the logistics become easy it become more relevant for remote settings than these two vaccines so that's a, that's a major difference so major difference in how they are made how they look how they store that's difference I would like to make another important, um, you know, analogy to explain how these vaccines work. And it's like a payment gateway. If you want to buy something from uh, something, there are many ways you can try. You can directly go to the merchant. You can go to a bank through uh, and get some money and then go to the mar uh, go to the merchant. Or sometimes you go to an instead of the bank, you directly go to an ATM. You get the money and go over there. But you can also do an online storage. Uh, or, 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 uh, we can go to online store and we can uh, have an um, you know purchase from there. We can use you know we can use a credit card over there. Sometimes people some in some countries we we don't use a credit card. Some 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 places people use some sensors. There are there are countries where there's no uh, cash also now exists. Only digital uh, digital money exists over there. So that this this all payment gateway works on one thing: specificity, specific identification of the user. Is using a card, probably using a number. Or and a second one is information. This is an information gateway. The, the immune system is also working almost like that. You look for specificity. So what is specificity? The specificity is a molecule which is on the virus. And then it gives a cascade of information. The cascade of information, in the case of virus, a real virus, it actually activates macrophages, T cells, B cells, a lot of immune networks, the entire networks it activates. And this network creates a lot of signals on a set of, a set of kinds. And this cytokine creates a cytokine storm. Actually, in the case of COVID, as many of you know, people are not killed by the virus, but rather by our own cytokine. Because this storm of cytokine creates cell death. It kills a lot of lung alveolar tissues. It creates ruptures, a lot of um, T cells, B cells, a lot of um, uh, we call PBMCs or our, our cytokine producing cells have been killed. So this generic inflammatory situation creates actually kills the people more than the virus itself the virus actually kickstart the immune system a very vigorous immune activation leads to the cytokine storm and what we that is often because immune system doesn't have the sanity to or doesn't have enough time to act against this viral load and that's what we are trying to change with the with the vaccine we would like to train the immune system to go systematically and slowly and selectively okay and how can we trigger that information cascade we can create the same information cascade created by virus can be created using different molecules but without the same vigor can we have a bit more dampened uh, immune activation so that when the virus comes immune system reacts a bit more hygienically that's the kind of a whole goal so basically, if the payment gateways can be activated at any stage, it can, we can go, you, see, you can use a credit card, we can use a debit card in a, in a bank terminal, you can go to the bank. The same story is also, if, you, if I take an analogy, okay, I would say uh, an, a viral vector, a viral vector is using like a credit card in an, in an uh, online store, okay? And in the case, I mean, in the case of an um, whole virus, it will be like going to the, it, go to the bank itself, okay? But in the case of mRNA vaccines, it's not even using a card. We don't even need a card. We just need a, a soft number, a really like a cryptocurrency. It's like a cryptocurrency. It just you put a number, and it just automatically creates everything. The Indian immune system has been activated. So the refinement, the molecular, the selection of the molecule de defines the refinement of the um, the immune response, and that refinement leads to you know instead of avoiding a cytokine storm, leads to a very systematic activation. For example. We, if we want to only activate the antibody producing cells, these plasma cells, that's one way. Or if we want to only activate the CD8 tel, uh, T cells, or if we only want to activate the adaptive part, this only part, okay, we don't want these macrophages, cytokines, all those things to be activated. And this such kind of a selective activation can be tailored using a selected molecule. And this selection has been uh, 
that is why people are using different different molecular methods for um, creating di uh, different vaccines now let's have a look what are those different signals in as i said uh, in the case of dna only the dna is used in the case of an rna vaccine rna packed into a lipid nanomolecule in the case of protein based vaccine we say ndr protein and in the case of an uh, inactivator where the whole virus is used so you can see there's a refinement so some of them are really refined some of them are really crude but all of them will work but all of them work in a different way because the whole virus may be may be triggering many more immune responses which may not be required okay because we give a whole virus immune system produces uh, responses not just against the spike it also produces against the entire other set of proteins but if you just give only that protein immune system will be selectively producing response against only the only this protein but if you only give the uh, uh, only give the nucleic acid the advantage is that okay the nucleic acid will be entering into the system it will produce its protein so basically this it also mimics how the protein is produced within the uh, viral infection that has a different advantage than giving the protein itself so basically that is that is the whole idea and the same story is about the uh, viral vector viral vector is also looks like a virus but it doesn't create um you know other other kind of immune responses but at the same time the viral vector that we generate it also produces unwanted response against its own uh, vector vector backbone that's why sometimes many repeated boosting with the same vector is also not good or may not, sometimes it's not not effective as well so the selection of the molecule is very important thing and designing the selection uh, being part of the selection is something which a pharmacist can be uh, helping because while selecting it is not selected just based on efficacy it's also based on selection uh, manufacturability it is also selected based on stability and all those important components or all those aspects are actually managed by pharmacists for example when i'm in a project someone is designing this thing the components or the topics relating to the characterization how it should look like how it can be tested the topics related to the formulation where it can be packed which kind of buffer it can be used and how it can be stored which storage temperatures uh, uh, and how what happens if a temperature escalation happens all those questions are addressed managed and uh, the work packages information for that has been developed by the a team led by my uh, my team which consists of a lot of pharmacists so basically those are the aspects in a vaccine design uh, a pharmacist is adding value so uh, i will keep, skip skip this thing so i would like to give you an idea that more than 35 different vaccines have been tested now the 35 has gone even to now 80 there are more than 80 different why we need a more vaccines why do, why can't we work with few because the point is that not all vaccines can be manufactured to the full scale so that the whole people of the globe can be vaccinated so we need when the uh, covid pandemic was started people gauged that we need minimum seven vaccines seven successful vaccines to cover the world so so far now we have eight or seven already uh, licensed so that's a good step a good number that we already reached probably we need more because different part of the world different people so different given different settings and also different boostings this may be a, a requirement so and many of them are all of them are into major four categories a virus viral vector nucleic acid and protein based there's something an interesting thing other in other is a very important thing is also i'm not discussing too much about today other is that it is an uh, antigen presenting cell the our own cell is been taken out okay they take take a human mammalian cells out they do an ex vivo activation with the nucleic acids outside and then transfer it back they are known as these others okay new completely new uh, type of vaccines which has been widely explored in uh, cancer let's have a look one by one how each vaccine is work working so a virus based vaccine that's a whole variety one example is covaxin what they do is that the whole vaccine it goes and get into a cell it produce i mean uh, it the, uh, in the case of a um, a weakened virus and attenuated virus it goes to body it actually enters cell it buds out replicates and presents an antigen presenting cell antigen presenting cells are gateways they look for any foreign antigen coming over there for example macrophages uh dendritic cells b cells they go and take up them they process them they really process and present to uh, antibody present, uh, producing cells and it creates an immune response in the case and vaccine like uh, whole virion vaccine like uh, covaxin it is heat killed or inactivated uh, not heat killed they are using a chemical uh, treatment known as beta propionolactam in that case the whole uh, virus is coming it directly uh, meets the antigen presenting cell and it produces an um, immune response how do we make in a virus based vaccines we grow the real virus 
in bioreactors, okay? And then we go for inactivation, and then we go to uh, formulation. And in the case of Covaxin, it's really, really an interesting story for Covaxin. If you look into the clinical trial data of Covaxin, Covaxin was ineffective when the virus vaccine alone was used. They had to use an adjuvant. This adjuvant is known as a chemosoap, imidazole quinoline into an aluminum hydroxyl gel. And this particular um, adjuvant is, was developed by an American company known as Viravax, which is headed by an, an Indian, which is known as Sunil David. He made that. And it's a very interesting story because without this adjuvant, the whole vaccine doesn't work. And what is the adjuvant? This adjuvant is imidazole quinoline, which is a TLR7 uh, um, agonist. Those people who are medicinal chemists over here, it's a very interesting medicinal chemistry story. People manage to understand how our immune system is working. Our immune system has a first gate, which are known as toll like receptors, innate immune receptors. People who identify these receptors got Nobel Prize as well. They actually check, so they are not, they check for any threat. Any threat coming from, they, they identify molecular patterns. So there's a difference between a, a threat versus a non threat. How does an immune system identify a threat? There should be chemistry behind it. There should be a mechanism behind it. So they use a set of receptors known as molecular pattern recognition receptors. So there is a molecular pattern which is embedded only on pathogens. Okay, there's completely different. So there's when there's an array of LPSs existing, there's an array of uh, certain proteins existing. That is a threat because the immune system is, as many of you know, immune system is developed. Human immune system is developed not to react to everything, but not but not to react. So with the, basically, immune system is, is a well-trained person. It is not an immune system is not a rowdy who do cause and kills everyone. Immune system is a very it's a ninja ninja fighter. It's a well-trained um, samurai. He know when to fight, when not to fight. And this training is based using these kind of receptors. It actually looks for it's a, it does a surveillance look for really threats, really pathogen. Because if an immune system acts against acts on everything. And if it goes uh, bus sick, what happens? It will kill your own cells. It will create autoimmune disorders. And uh, many of the modern problem are autoimmune. Even people now say diabetes has an autoimmune uh, element. Cancer has an autoimmune element. People say even, even asthma, asthma is clearly autoimmune element. So many of these problems that we have currently, healthcare, lifestyle diseases are linked to autoimmune because when our immune system is mistrained, okay? And uh, immune system, to to keep constraints and only to react against selective pathogens, immune system is something called molecular patterns. And this is using a molecular pattern receptors. And this receptor structure, knowledge of these receptor structures help medicinal chemists to go and do a structure-based understanding. How can I create a dock? How can I dock a molecule over there? They did docking experiments. Then they created a, a class of small molecules, which is known as immunosoquinolin, and which can really activate so using a molecular key, a new small molecule, we can create the same threat that a, vi a, a virus may create, a, a bacteria will create. And it's a very interesting story. So that is what I'm saying. So when you give the virus, the heat kill virus itself, immune system doesn't react to that. So that's why Covaxin was ineffective. They had to add this, uh, this particular imidacinolin, which is a medicinal chemist product, which actually adsorbed to alum, and this is known as adjuvant. And this only mixture is effective. And now, Having said this thing, someone can design this virus, a microbiologist. But now when you put, what should be the pH, what formulation, how do we put that together with this particular um, complex uh, adjuvant, which is, an, which is a crystal, which is a salt. The aluminum salt is an aluminum hydroxyl. This is the gelucil that we eat. What do gelucil is? How do you know how gelucil looks like? How many of you saw gelucil looks like a viscous solution. So from there, that viscous solution, something which is injectable, Okay, how do how can they convert that into that's formulation? That formulation is done by a pharmacist, and that is that is the uh, the, the, the the most important contribution. This identifying this uh, developing these imidazolecanolins or this molecular pattern recognition receptor agonist, putting that together with an alkyl gel and putting that together with an virus to make a cocktail which is injectable, safe to inject, and that is what is the the, the magic of uh, pharmacy or formulation. The another example, a uh, great example, is viral vectors. In the case of viral, uh, viral vectors, there are two different types, replicating and not replicating, which one to use, which one to not to use. But the most important thing, which I will also would like to highlight over here, how do we select a vector? Okay, How do we uh, clone it over there? Okay, And how, what kind of capsid structure should be there? 
how can we mutate the caspid so that unwanted responses can be avoided? Forget about all the things. The most important thing where pharmacies also plays an important role is that many of you know, maybe with COVID shield and also the Anson vaccine, there was a case of uh, TSS, that is thrombocytopenia. So basically people with a uh, few people, especially uh, ladies at the age group of 40, started uh, getting clots. This clot formation was an important problem. Now people say that it's because this viral vector, which has a lot of uh, negative charge on its surface, really binds to a protein, which is known as PF4, which is on the platelets, and they forms clots. Now people are working, how can I engineer this structure? Or how can I do a make a formulation where I select a right buffer, like using the equation of henderson hassan we can predict if you use the right buffer, what would be the, uh, the, the, because we know the PK of all the amino acids. So if you know that we can actually predict what could be the surface charge, what would be the zeta potential on the surface of this molecule. And the zeta potential drives whether it will bind to a protein, unwanted protein like PF4, then leading to a, a clot formation. So these kind of interesting questions are actually driven, supported by pharmacists. What kind of charge a pro molecule will have? How can I modulate the charge by using selecting the right excipients, right uh, buffer? And then how do we manufacture the entire thing putting together? That's the important thing. And if you're a bit more interested in, in, in designing of the molecules, you can also be involved in the, the cloning, the uh, design of these uh, sequence over there, and also in selecting uh, and also the stability, the most important the stability, because once we make these, these things, they tend to aggregate. How can we prevent aggregation of them? How can we um, uh, ensure that during the manufacturing process, they stay intact, they don't break up. Those are all interesting stories that pharmacists support. Another important class is subunit vaccines. And one of them is DNA vaccine, and which uh, DNA vaccine is a full, full DNA, which actually goes over there. And then uh, DNA creates mRNAs and viral proteins, and that leads to immune response. In the case of an, a protein subunit vaccine, classical example is uh, a M protein uh, based vaccine, which actually came from, um, sorry, the um, Novavax. Novavax recently have a protein base, which is also adjuvenated. I'll come to that, what's adjuvant behind it. And the other interesting thing is this protein is, in the case of Novavax, they use a protein, they recombinantly express a protein in a uh, baculovirus system or in an, in an, uh, through a, using baculovirus in an insect. And this virus is actually self assembled sorry, they're not, this viral protein is actually self assembled into a nanoparticle. It's a protein nanoparticle. They're not using the protein itself, okay? But many people don't have this technology. And what do they do is they make the protein and then pack them into a liposome, known as virus select particle. So it looks like a virus, but it's not a virus. It is a lipid bilayer they create. And this entire thing, the lipid bilayer that you create, is, uh, is, is, it's a, is a pharmacist because you use microfluidization. It's technology that we learned in, in, in our school, basic technology that we learned in school. And the entire characterization of them, what is the size of the molecule, how the, how the molecule behaves in different pH, what is the surface density of this, uh, these proteins over there, how much protein is in, uh, present over there. And these, these even many people don't understand particles. We are learned to understand particles because we learn in, in physical pharma pharmacy, volume equivalent uh, diameter, um, you know, uh, number equivalent diameter, and all those technologies, terminologies are quite familiar to us. And we can only define the critical quality attribute. These structure of the, uh, these, 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 these uh, formulations are also key attributes and which regulators want to see. Because at the end, developing a vaccine is not an, it's an, it's an one dimension activity. It is not done by the manufacturer itself. It is done together with the regulators. We need to tell regulators what are the key attributes of a vaccine that you are making and why these key attributes are important and how do you control it? What are the methods that you use? Which kind of assay? So we say DLS for particle size. I use a, a protein method or a capital digital force for the protein content. I need to tell people also, tell the regulator, then only the regulator will give you licensing. So the licensing is about making it and also consistently making you need to tell that, okay, how consistently these structures have been uh, conserved throughout the manufacturing cycle. So starting from the seed before it goes to the into the manufacturing plant, starting from the seed, we need to monitor it. From seed, genetic stability, protein stability, and colloidal stability, all those things are quite important, especially the colloidal stability is the most important thing that pharmacists keeps in control of this thing. From there, manufacturing consistency is very important during manufacturing, how this entire product is keeping its consistency. From there, then we, after um, going out of our um, manufacturing unit, how the stability, especially stability at the end user side is also important. The entire 
uh, pipeline of the vaccine manufacturing uh, pharmacies plays an important role. So I just wanted to give a very important uh, message about the Novavax. The, the case of Novavax, as I said, it's kind of a nanoparticle where the protein is being self-assembling into a nanoparticle and they give together with an, another adjuvant known as matrix M. I would like to give a bit an idea about why the same story when you give a subunit vaccine like a uh, protein nanoparticle immune system doesn't react because to if you give a vaccine to a site of injection we need to attract immune system and immune system should react to that but immune system is trained not to react so when we give a just plain protein immune system just disregards that it become ineffective now in order to create an infection like scenario we have to give often in many cases we have to create an a pathogen lag situation. That's why we use an adjuvant, okay? When an adjuvant comes over there, it actually attracts, it, it actually triggers the molecular patterns, which is relevant to an uh, infection setting. Then the immune system thinks, we are fooling the immune system. Immune system thinks that it's, it's an infection. It brings all the cells over there and it then processes a protein, it creates a vaccine. Now, how do we de define these adjuvants? It's also a very interesting story, I think, Pharmacists are an integral part of this thing. I'll give an interesting story of this thing. So the Novavax vaccine has a uh, protein component, as I said, it's a kind of, and it also has an adjuvant, which is known as QS21. It's coming from the tree known as Qualia saponoria. And it's a very interesting story. This tree is only available now in Chile, okay? It's only available in Chile. For the bark of the tree, this is something which we learned in the pharmac pharmacognosis. It's an, it's an a trepin uh, uh, trepinoid glycoside, okay? And only this particular, if this molecule is not there, this vaccine is not effective. This molecule needs to be isolated from the bark and need to be packed into an, into an um, uh, nanoparticle of 40 nanometer that actually acts as an adjuvant. The entire idea about extracting it and chromatographic separation and only a fraction of that QS21 means fraction 21, only a fraction has been isolated, characterized, and then you know uh, putting them into, into a particle and then formulating them with this protein. Ah, this is this is where a, a pharmacist has a very very important role. Now, the interesting story behind is that, as many of you know, probably some of you know, there are different protocols like Kyoto Protocol, Nahoya Protocol. These are different protocols that the entire globe signs. So Nahoya Protocol is about a protocol which Chile also signed. According to Nahoya Protocol, it's a kind of an agreement. When you sign to a Nahoya Protocol, you cannot use your natural resources for commercial purposes. So the whole globe is depending on Chile for this particular bar to make this adjuvant. And this adjuvant is not just for use for COVID vaccine, it's only used for many other vaccines. For example, recent uh, shingles vaccine, um, herpes vaccine, it has, been, it has been used. So, but now since Chile has signed up this particular um, uh, higher protocol, we cannot exploit Chile's trees or Chile's tree bars to produce it. Now people are behind, running behind to produce this in alternative ways. So that means they're trying to chemically synthesize it. When you chemically synthesize, people have to define because the entire molecule cannot be defined. It means the extract contains three or five different molecules. Which molecule to make? Or can the entire molecule, if you chemically synthesize, it's not going to be commercially viable. Can we make a part of that? So a structural relationship. People are doing a lot of SIRs, structural relationship of this particular molecule. And another interesting story is that some people are trying to take the entire genetic machinery, which is relevant in biosynthesis of this particular molecule from this uh, bark, uh, from the tree. They're transferring the entire genes into another plant cell to do a tissue culture-based production. But when you produce it, then in, through tissue culture, through a lab, this particular molecule, and then extract it, uh, regulators will ask you how it is comparable with existing vaccine, or existing adjuvant. That comparison is also, a pharmacist plays an important role because the, both has to be then packed into a uh, packaging system, and then has to be tested, uh, show equivalency. So the bioequivalency or immunoequivalency is very important for that. It's a very, very uh, quite interesting story. This is also something which is going to be futuristic because since this is not going to be coming more, no more from plant, a lot of companies are diving into this thing. A lot of research is going around this part as well. So it's an interesting story about how vaccine and how pharmacists are, are playing a uh, role. Another important thing is it's DNA or RNA vaccines. And in the case of our DNA RNA vaccine, we the DNA vaccine is one of the most painful delivery system currently. We have to deliver through electroporation, where that means we literally break using a, a, a giving voltage to the skin of the per, uh, person to give a, a nucleus over there. And that is why probably some of you not noticed this. We need three immunizations with 
the carrier vaccines, not two. In the case of the RNA vaccine, we need to package them into lipos into kind of lipid nanoparticle. The direct, directly, this mRNA goes over there. And the difference between the protein, I would like to go to this payment gateway uh, signal. So we can give the signal a different level. In the case of virus, we give the direct virus. In the case of a subunit protein, we uh, sorry, in the case of an viral vector, vector, we come one more down. We take the viral information, pack it with another alternate viral virus. In the case of protein weight steps, we go one more step down. We give only the protein. In the case of an, a nucleic acid vaccine, we just go one more step down. We directly give them the nucleic acid. But there's an advantage of that. The advantage is that this nucleic acid go and produce virus protein because it's like virus, viral infection, real viral infection. The nucleic acid gets into over there. It actually creates um, viral proteins and get presence on the antigen person itself. So the immune system automatically gets a feeling that I have an infection happening in, in, inside me. So that's why they are self adjuvenating so mRNA vaccine doesn't need this one adjuvant. This molecular understanding how the translation of an mRNA to protein help us to know that, okay? So if you give in, but giving an mRNA directly, naked, this has been tested for so many years. So if you just give an RNA, immune system kills because immune system or the human bodies evolved to kill all bacterial RNAs or any RNAs. Any mRNA comes, mRNA is one of the most a susceptible, unstable molecule. So in order to make it stabilize, we need to bring that into a, into a uh, lipid nanoparticle. So if you pack into a nanoparticle, it actually protects it against, against the other hydrolytic enzymes outside the extracellular space. And once it's inside the cell, it actually creates a kind of virus, virus uh, infection-like scenario. It translates and it produces a lot of protein and the cell surface is completely enriched with these uh, proteins. And these proteins, then uh, uh, you know stimulates uh, immune cells and that leads to immune responses and that's why it's a kind of self adjuvanating system but one problem as i said they all have a, a poor stability at two to four degrees this is also an, a big area which is now a lot of pharmacists now working how can i stabilize how can i improve the stability i i i recommend everybody to this is a very interesting story this particular girl uh, this chromaline, she's, an, she's an, just a master's student. She just found out that why these uh, mRNA vaccines are unstable. She went and read everything, brought a nice literature review just recently this, this month. It's a very nice uh, review. I recommend everybody to read that. And what we, what we are looking into this thing, how can we improve? Because if you don't improve the stability of this vaccine, this vaccine cannot be brought to uh, most of the part of the world. Currently, this has been used in Israel, US, Canada, Canada Europe, but if you want to bring to the rest of the part of the world, we need to improve this stability and to bring to two to four degrees. Because, you know, uh, this, you can see stability at room temperature is already 12 hours, which is bit really, really uh, uh, very little, okay, uh, very short. And uh, how can we improve it? Can we improve by structurally changing the structure? Can we improve by adding better stabil uh, stabilizers or pH or buffers? All those kind of questions are also very active field of research. Now, if you look at a mRNA structure, a mRNA structure, has an, uh, uh, is flanked by tutuitia regions, is poly, uh, uh, um, poly adenosines uh, tail, these coding sequences. Now, as you know, this is not just a normal sequence. They also do, a, they modify the nucleotides so that it can be more stable. So many of you may be recollecting a nucleotide has an, you know, a, a kind of a sugar part, a base, a phosphodiester linkages. So that people are now playing around to even change the glycosidic linkage over there instead of a N glycosid can be covered. C glycoside. There's a lot of medicine chemists working on that. Okay, so that improve the stability. People are also thinking, how can I change this? Uh, improve the stability of this phosphodiester linkage because that is one of the problem for the uh, instability reasons. Can we change with the, instead of oxygen with the thiol ring? There are many questions being asked. Many structural uh, medicine chemistry questions have been asked to improve the structure of this thing. Because the beauty of that, the entire thing is made by chemical synthesis. Now the synthesis is also an automated synthesis where a lot of pharmacists are playing a role because it's like a continuous synthesis. You add one amino acid, sorry, one uh, nucleic acid, uh, acid uh, base, base, another one. So one by one, one by one, we get kind of a chain reaction, which go one by one by one, the chain is completed, we terminate the chain reaction. And this particular automated synthesis is also an interesting area because currently these were made for, initially when uh, mRNA vaccines were designed, they were made for probably 40,000 patients or so. But how can we give millions of patients? That means the entire technology has to be scaled up. And that technology never existed because the requirement of a global vaccine, global mRNA vaccine only started in 2020 March. 
since in their one year people are now defining how can i scale up there's a lot of and, and the thing is that all the raw materials which are required for making this mrna it's not just mrna because i said this mrna needs to be packaged so people are also now exploring different packaging routes for that so people sometimes use a kind of protein which is a protein it can we make a complex with the protein can we use modified dendrimers for that we can use a protein uh, with a liposome lipid na- peg nanoparticle can be pegylated so even the lipid nanoparticle can, how can improve it even the lipids used for the specialized lip- lipids used for packaging mrnas are also not available we need to synthesize them we need to find new synthetic mechanisms new sources for them so the this mrna is a new revolution which is because it's like you know earlier we need to have cash to buy something now we can just have a code to order something just like that simplicity mrna is like you know it's like um it's like an app uh which will activate the entire operating system so this uh the earlier if a vaccine developed to 12 years now with mrna is like you know so recently somebody has shown something for a new seasonal vaccine they went to the internet they downloaded a sequence with somebody uh, sub, uh, for the, uh, somebody submitted for the emerging strain they downloaded a sequence converted that into mrna synthesized and made a vaccine so this is a way the no modern vaccines will be made in a very short age of a very short uh, development time and this is all possible because this uh, the development of mrna vaccines and but if this mrna vaccine has to become a reality there are a lot of challenges challenges of making it in a large scale so the synthesis of the uh, the mrna and the so the lipids the raw materials then packaging them how can they make in very large scale and what kind of packaging uh, what is the molecular engineering of this packaging systems what kind of charges to be put over there how can we tailor the charges how can we change the theta potential of this thing how can we make it complex sessions and what sizes now we use 1 to 1 uh, 100 nanometer can we go a bit more lower like 40 60 can we go um, can we prevent aggregation of this thing can we uh, st- create stealthing of this thing all those things are relevant research questions are pharmacists are actively involved pharmacists work together with polymer scientists pharmacists work together with um, many other uh, biotechnologists to improve that and that is a great opportunity and the next 10 years i'm sure is going to be the uh, the age of mrna vaccines so i hope i could highlight the most important uh, role of uh, pharmacists in developing vaccines i would also would like to give two short um, requests to pharmacists which is the role of pharmacists in facts delivering the made vaccine not the developing vaccine really made vaccines uh, especially the next talk is all about that this is a one message is kind of a humble request this is someone has looked into how these anti vaccinators are developing okay or this you know people who actually hate vaccines who who only uh, share negative image of vaccines this is the global evaluation of the um groups virtual groups or social media networks which are working against different vaccines so if you see pro vaccination groups are 6.9 million groups a number of individuals with 125 groups but the number of clusters with anti vaccination people who work against vaccine in the whole globe is 317 that shows there are many more people who are unaware of the vaccines who propagate negative messages about vaccines or anti vaxxers okay i think this is a place more than developing i mean of course developing vaccine research in vaccine pharmacists can play a role but more than that i think community pharmacists who are really working as the at a first hand with the patients has an important role to play over there i they can take a major role in as an immunizer i have many friends who are classmates who are really pharmacists who are playing a major role as immunizers we can be vaccine facilitators we can get vaccines people uh, uh, promote vaccination um, drives as well we can also act as a vaccine advocate we should really promote people uh, to promote to people the idea of vaccines tell them all vaccines are important all vaccines are um, working all are efficacious why they are different okay is because uh, the way they are made okay and when you talk about this efficacy of this vaccine stuff many of you may be may, may hear that the pfizer vaccine has 90 percentage vac- uh, efficacy whereas uh, the adenovector va- uh, vaccine has only 60 60 60 to 80 percent or 70 to 70 percent uh, efficacy dna vaccine has only 50 percent efficacy but what is its efficacy is all about its efficacy means <clears throat> it really depends upon not the number please don't hang on the number 
it is really depends upon where the vaccine was tested. When the mRNA vaccines were tested, because since it could have been made so fast, because they just need a sequence to synthesize and convert into vaccine, they could go into clinic fast. But when they tested for the efficacy, all these new strains were not available. They had only one strain that had 90% efficacy. Okay. And also they tested not throughout the world, tested only one or a couple of sites in the world. But when the next generation vaccines, so the, the slow vaccines like the adenovector vaccines were developed, for example, the Anson vaccines, it was tested in 212 different spots of the world. So by that time, three more, three or four. So how many more, uh, how many more um, different um, variants were uh, coming? So this number is also reflects the efficacy against new vari emerging variants as well. So please don't hang to this one number. This number doesn't translate to anything. The, what it translates is that if it's more than 50%, it actually works. That's the most important thing. And it, it should also work against the, more, uh, the new um, variants as well. As we know, Moderna, as well as Pfizer, is already working on a new booster because the sequence that's selected were first from the first variant. And the second way, it is not protecting effectively against the second variant. That's why they already rolled out rolled out a new a new booster a booster. So anybody who got Pfizer vaccine or Moderna vaccine, especially, are requested to go for new booster for especially to protect against the Delta variant or the new variants. But since the technology enables them because it's a fast technology, they just need to know the sequence so that they can synthesize and pack into lipid lipid nanoparticles that allows them to respond quickly to the uh, emerging uh, pandemics. So I think a pharmacist should play an important role in, um, in, in communicating the value of the vaccines, different vaccines that are available, how they are made, and how the efficacy is, is being translated, et cetera, et cetera. I think with this, I will stop. I, I took much more the time I think I was supposed to. Sorry for that. I'll conclude and I'll directly go to the last slide. OK, Manish, you're on. Thank you. You're on time, it's no problem. Okay. Uh, in the now, meantime, then I'll just, just give one, one last question, a few, few mm -hmm. key questions, probably that in your mind. Okay. Do people develop immunity? I, my answer would be yes. It has been shown now. Many people who are vaccinated got um, uh, again positive, but they never had any any serious or very few people. I, or I am about to wait, I'm waiting for instances where people who are really protected getting serious uh, COVID situations. So the the advantage is that okay, not advantage. the key point is that after getting vaccinated, it doesn't mean that you don't get you won't get uh, COVID. You may get COVID positive because in the history of vaccination, the most difficult disease to control is mildest disease. All vaccines works against severe form of the disease. Every infection has different stages: mild form, intermediate form, severe forms. We can only educate immune system against severe forms. That's why uh, absolute sterile, sterile immunity is it's only a wishful thinking. So we will get um, uh, viral infections, but we may not be severely, uh, our health may not be severely impacted. Okay, that's the advantage. So please bear, beware in mind, even if you get fully vaccinated, please don't roam around and please, please keep social distancing till all of us are vaccinated. If, you, uh, if humans develop immunity, how long this does it last? It's a very important question. We don't have information, we are still waiting, okay? But <clears throat> based on our previous experiences, we expect it to stay long, but we don't know how new variants will come. If new variants, which are, I mean, variants are like, you know, it's like a point. If you like take the, the entire sequence of an uh, coronavirus, uh, genetic sequence like a poem, okay? If you change a couple of couple of letters, their mutations, uh, the meaning of the poem doesn't change, okay? If you change a word, probably the meaning of it doesn't change. So mutations are not very important because first of all, these, uh, these um, coronaviruses are not heavily mutating like HIV or so, okay? So they have mutations because they have their RNA virus, they are self mutation correcting mechanism. So all the mutations they correct, try to correct. So, but still they mutates, but all the mutations are not consequential. The mutation become consequences like, you know, it completely changed the meaning of the poem, okay? If it changes entirely, it deletes a complete stanza of the poem, the, then it becomes so important. So it's not about mutation, it's about consequential mutations. But those consequential mutations are called as these variants. That's why we have alpha, beta now, 
uh, we, we are under Delta. I don't know what would be the next one. So luckily due to informatic developments, we are daily on a regular basis, we are sequencing all the emerging uh, variants. We can put everything together and we can predict what could be the next one which is coming as well. That helps us to be prepared for with the next generation booster to be ready. So maybe a booster is required for many on a seasonal basis for emerging variants. We don't know this information is yet to come. What kind of immune response should vaccine developers look for? This was a key question. I think it is now clear. Neutralizing antibodies are really helping, but vaccines like mRNA vaccines and uh, adenovector viral vaccines are also not just uh, giving um, uh, antibody-based uh, neutralization titers, but they're also giving cell mediated response as well. That's something which is now that actually this understanding actually helps us to really read the that's not as correlated protections. They can develop correlated protections. They can look into patients and look whether patients are protected by looking into the markers over there where they produce antibodies, where they produce particular cells that actually translates into efficacy. How do we know if a vaccine is likely to work? Yeah, that's a that's a looking at the markers and also looking into the uh, dropping of the incidence rates. Will it be safe? I think all the vaccines are shown to be safe except few of them showed some safety issues like these uh, clotting ca um, cases. I think people are working heavily and they're working hard to improve it. I'm sure that will be improved into, I think that it's also not so much a serious, I mean, it's a serious case, but it's only in one in one million, but still they're working to avoid it. Can we, and I think the most important question is this, can we ensure an equitable distribution of vaccines? What does it mean? If you look, all the first doses of vaccine made in the globe were taken by rich countries. Still, there's a big meat, there's a big uh, population outside which are not vaccinated. Can we, there should be um, mechanisms to ensure equitable distribution. Luckily, projects like COVAX are, are coming up. Havi, Gavi, uh, the organization like Gavi and SEPI are playing a major role. Gates Foundation is playing, uh, WHO is playing a major role. They're trying to source vaccines so that equitable vaccine distribution. Even India also played by important role in sharing a lot of vaccines to this, um, this CP program. I think that's also the most important thing because if everybody is not, if everybody is not safe, nobody's safe. So equitable distribution of vaccine is also an important question that we need to be keeping in mind and where pharmacists can play an important role. Anish, can I end up here? Yeah. Yeah, uh, we are run. I uh, mean, the next session is about to start at 12.15. I'm, so... I'm, I'm, stop I'm stopping. Okay. I'll to leave with this thing. I'm happy to be here. Sorry if I take a couple of uh, a few minutes more. And um, if you have a couple of questions, I may be happy to answer. Okay, we and, have uh, we had a number of questions from first one was Chako sir, Sadish sir, Unnikrishna Pandika sir. Or I think with your last slides, with your uh, many questions, you have, you have answered all the other questions. And then I have a question from Jay Sharan sir. The question is, what strategic approach could be adopted in the molecular pattern? To reduce the cytokine storms and ADRs. I think you have not touched upon the cytokine storm part. What yeah, I mean, approach uh, could uh, be adopted first, in the molecular part? Yeah, that's, that's a um, okay. really a very good question. So just to uh, come back to that, uh, the cytokine uh, storm happens. Why the cytokine storm happens? Cytokine storms happen because when the immune system activates in an uncontrolled fashion, okay? So because it doesn't have enough time, it actually goes in a, it's in a panic mode. It goes there and try to do whatever it comes because the virus is uh, replicating so fast. The replication time of virus is so fast. Immune system is, because if you look, the replication time for immune cell is probably 14 days and virus is, is probably an hour, okay? So millions of viruses actually storming. The viral titer is so high. So immune system then doesn't have enough time to act to that. Okay, so then uh, that is why this immune system then it leads to cell death, leads to cytokine storm, and that creates an inflammatory situation. If you develop a vaccine also like that, it creates, you know, uh, instead of a fine, refined response, if you go for uh, a kind of a, a create a panic mode in system in, in, in immune activation, it will lead to, lead to something called cytokine, and a cytokine storm. And how can we reduce it? That is why people are understand, going to this molecular understanding. So for example, one of the things they said, okay, we want to only, we know which TLR receptor, TLR is a molecular, molecular pattern recognition, the toll-like receptor. For example, if you target TLR4, we know which kind of cytokine will be coming. If you TLR7, which kind of cytokine is coming? 
This is in very clearly documented scientifically. So by selectively uh, picking up the agonist, which is responsible for a, a, a subtype of an um, a subtype of an immune receptor, we can shape, we can tailor the kind of cytokines that will be produced. And if you know which cytokine is important for educating a T cell or B cell, this also known. For example, if you know TH17, it's very important. People know that. People know that IL-6 is quite relevant, okay? Or people don't want that we don't need IL-10. People know IF and gamma is very important. So we know which kind of an adjuvant or molecular trigger is relevant for eliciting a particular cytokine. This information is known. By picking and choosing and bringing that into formulation, we can then tailor and customize the kind of cytokine which comes. By customizing the cytokine, we can also customize a kind of immune activation or type of immune activation which will happen, whether it's a TH1 activation or a TH2 activation, this can also be done. So that's the that's whole idea. And okay. yeah. That was a question from Dr. P. Jayashagar, sir. I think you have, he, my, my sir has cleared your, uh, you have cleared your sir's doubt. And then we have an interesting question from Andrea. First, the question is, studies say once a person get infected with COVID antibodies in high amount, uh, antibodies in high amount are present at least for eight months only, then how can inactivated virus or a part can reduce more lasting immunity? Uh, yeah, this is a very, uh, it's a very good question. Unfortunately, it needs some more time to um, explain, but mm. I can try to explain it in a very simple way. So, mm. uh, uh, yeah, making the, okay, the, when some, okay, Let's, let's, let's go, go there. So um, when a person is getting infected by a virus, okay, you get a natural immunity, okay? When you get a natural immunity, as I said, the, the uh, okay, it's like, um, sorry, I will take an example, a simple, a simple example. If you, there, there are two kinds of students. When you go to an exam, we have a student who is very systematically studying. Who every day they study something, they do the homework, they work everything very nicely, and they are well prepared, and uh, they go to the exam in a very calm, composure, and they, they they do a good performance. That's one kind of student. The second kind of student who who is actually enjoying the whole life, and just before the exam, maybe a two three days before the exam, who goes and cramps up everything and go and does the exam. That student will be stressed. And who, who, who didn't do the education in a, in a proper way, but he actually managed, maybe he'll pass the exam, but his education is not compared to the, the student's first one, okay? So this is how, the, if you look immuni this uh, immunization or va vaccination as an education. So in the case of vaccination, we give immune system enough time to, it is not in a panic mode. It takes enough time to differentiate. It, it's, it takes a time to present it. It goes through the all uh, magical transformations it, all the somatic hypermutations, all the um, follicular cell transformations, everything. So there's minimum cell death, but rather more cell proliferation and differentiation. It's like this case of the first student who takes all the time and systematic study. And that's why when, uh, uh, then there's less damage created over there. That's where the quality of immune response which comes out, the antibody which comes out is also much better antibodies. It will be high. It induces somatic hypermutation, high affinity antibody generated. And if an antibody is high, high affinity, the immune system, how the, okay, if you need to know, we, we keep the immune cells in our body in micro anatomic space, which are bone marrows or spleens. There, we, that is a, if you look, the costliest real estate in the globe is our micro anatomic space because we have very little space. We have to store immune cells against all pathogens that we encounter in life. So we have to be very selective over there. We cannot keep all immune cells. So then how do we selectively select over there? We look for only the most efficient, the most um, high affinity antibody harboring cells are been allowed to store, stay over there. The rest everything has been removed, killed. So if you go by that, that kind of a mechanism, the high affinity cells can stay, the low affinity cells will tie away, okay? That's a story. So in the case of a vaccination, since we give the immune system enough time to go through this process of affinity maturation, somatic hypermutation, we manage to generate immune cells which can stay longer because it has a signal, all the relevant signals which tells the microanatomy space store it. But in the case of a, uh, in the case of viral infection, boom, it kind like everything comes like a bomb. Immune system is in a panic mode. It more cell death. It doesn't have enough time to undergo affinity maturation because if you do all those kind of things, some affinity maturation may happen. 
but it doesn't have enough time uh, to undergo all the transformations. Its idea is to fight the virus mostly. So it produces, just keeps on producing a lot of antibodies. And it be, like, it's like the second student, you know, probably some, in some cases it actually uh, recovers. It's actually fights over the virus uh, because it's not that only the first class of students pass, passes the exam. The second uh, type of students also pass the exam as well, you know, but it is not compared to the first one the education that we get through the systematic approach. And that's what is the uh, vaccine is uh, giving. I hope I could... Uh, yes, you that, was, that was a very simple answer, Anish. Anyway, thank you very much, Anish. Uh, if I had enough time, I could have taken uh, questions from Chako sir, uh, Sadish sir, uh, and many other questions are there. But for the time being, uh, you have covered the various aspects of vaccine development. You have explained it very in a very simple manner, I think it was very interesting. It was indeed a brainstorming session, Anish. So in spite of very busy with your professional and personal life, thank you for joining us from being a Sunday. Also, you managed some time for us. I express my sincere thanks to Dr. Anish for joining us today. Uh, we'll be sharing your certificate of uh, participation in your personal mail ID from all the Office bearers of IPGA, I express my sincere thanks to all the participants. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank Over you once you, again, Sonia. everyone. Thank you. I'll see you later. Yes, thank, thank you, you so much. much. So, Anish, if you have time, you can be a part of the next part also, session also. I'll say for some time, I have an appointment uh, coming no up problem. in 10 minutes. No problem. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Over to you, Sonia. Thank you. Thank you, sir. That was really informative session, and yes. I hope all of us are aware of our role in developing versatile anti pandemic vaccines with the excellent presentation of Dr. Anish sir. Yes, we have two vaccine facilitators, vaccine advocates, and ensured vaccine heroes. Thank you so much, Anish sir, and wishing you more success. And I would like to thank the moderator, Ranjit sir. Thank you so much once again. Now, let's have a look onto the role of pharmacists in vaccination. We are so blessed with the right person for the topic, respected Professor Olwa Choing. Dean, Faculty of Pharmacy, University of Ibadan, Nigeria. With much respect, we are waiting for you, ma'am. And I'm feeling so privileged to invite Dr. Limsi Tambi to introduce our next speaker of the day. Limsi, Lim ma'am, is working as Associate Professor, Department of Pharmaceutics, Chemist College of Pharmaceutical Sciences and Research, Varikoli. She has completed her graduation from JSS College of Pharmacy, UT, and post graduation from Sri Ramakrishna Institute of Paramedical Sciences and honored with a PhD from Anamalai University. Mem is a well experienced academician with an experience of nearly 14 years and a life member of IPGA, IPA, and APGI. She's having several international publications and PhD guideship along with the foreign project in her credit. With immense pleasure and respect, I invite you, ma'am, to moderate the next session. Over to you, ma'am. So, no, am I audible? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. You are audible, ma'am. Thank you, Sonu, for the warm welcome. A warm good morning to one and all. Respected most valued guests, honorable and respected IPJ members, esteemed delegates for their presence in this auspicious event. We are eagerly waiting for Professor Oliver Chaim A. Odeko to hear about the pharmacist role in vaccination lessons from COVID-19 pandemic. Pharmacists have been on the front lines of pandemic response and prevention for the past year. First of all, I thank the organizers who have given me the opportunity to introduce Professor Oliver Join. Professor Oliver Join is a professor of pharmaceutics and pharmaceutical technology and the Dean of Faculty of Pharmacy at University of Ibadan, Nigeria. She holds a Bachelor of Pharmacy from Obafemi Oba Oluwa University MSc and PhD degrees in pharmaceutics from University of Ibadan, Nigeria. She had her postal training at Hebrew University of Jerusalem School of Pharmacy, Jerusalem, Israel. Professor Odeko has a recipient of many research fellowships and awards to her credit. She has been a visiting scientist to several universities, among them are the University of Manchester School of Pharmacy, Manchester, UK, Shanghai Institute of Materia Medica, Shanghai, China, Martin Luther University, Halle, Germany, and University of Würzburg, Germany. Professor Rodeko has been a recipient of many research fellowships and awards. 
She is a co-principal investigator for a TED Fund National Research Grant to study genetic and mechanistic basics of memory loss from environmental toxins and old age dementia, a protective role of nanocytes delivered phytomedicals. She is also the chairman of Codeine Control and Related Matters Working Group of Pharmacists Council of Nigeria and a member of Presidential Advisory Committee on the Elimination of Drug Abuse. Her research interests include drug, drug delivery, nanotechnology, indigenous excipients, development and formulation herbal medicinal products. She has credited with 110 articles in books, chapters in books, and peer-reviewed journal articles. She is a fellow of West African Postgraduate College of Pharmacists, West African Research Council, and Nigerian Academy of Science. With a brief introduction, I invite Professor Oliver Toyn to deliver the talk on the topic. Welcome, ma'am. Over to you, ma'am. Very much. Good morning. I hope you can hear me. Yes, ma'am. We can hear you. You are audible. Okay. Thank you very much. I want to start by appreciating the, uh, the organizers for this kind invitation. And I also want to thank the chairman of this occasion, the and the moderator. Thank you for the kind introduction. Um, this morning, I'm going to be talking very briefly about the role, pharmacist's role in vaccination, lessons from COVID-19. It's very early here in Nigeria. Nigeria is, is four and a half hours ahead of uh, India. So I've been on since about 5.30 a.m. But uh, it's really a great privilege for me to share with you this morning. And as it has been said, I want to appreciate Dr. Anish for that very important uh, and lucid lecture about the role of pharmacists in va uh, manufacturing uh, vaccines. We know pharmacists for the last one, almost two years now, we've been one and a half years, we've been at the front line of the COVID pandemic. So I'm going to talk about some of our roles, and uh, this is the outline. We'll look at the traditional roles of pharmacists in um, vaccination, and then what the benefit that has been accrued over the years. Then what and can a pharmacist vaccinate, and then we'll look at the lessons from COVID-19, and then the challenges and barriers where we we'll still have some. Um, uh, that uh, the pharmacist vaccination is not um, practiced in all uh, countries. So I'm going to talk about, um, first to start by way of introduction, we know that uh, vaccination has saved millions of lives of people all over the world. And it is one of the most successful and cost-effective health interventions. We remember the uh, the smallpox um, pandemic, an estimated uh, 300 million people were infected and it was so terrible and devastated. We know from what we have that uh, vaccination has saved a lot of people. And every year, about it says about two to three million lives each year. It has improved the global health. Uh, there are diseases, uh, some diseases are preventable with vaccine. And I think Dr. Anish mentioned some of them, polio, measles, diphtheria, and so on. So we have vaccines available and that has reduced the mobility and of course the mortality from those diseases. And uh, traditionally physicians, nurses, and uh, Nigeria, some community health workers have been trained uh, uh, the professionals in charge of vaccination. And they, they administer vaccine in a wide range of settings, in the clinics, in the primary health care center, community health care center, and schools. I remember when uh, I was young, it's common for the community health workers during a particular period, especially um, vaccination against measles and, uh, and uh, chickenpox that was uh, predominant at that time in Nigeria to come around the schools to vaccinate uh, the children because that is the easiest way to get the children all in one place. 
And that but despite the effectiveness and availability of vaccine, we still discover that some people still do not access. And record have shown that about one out of 10 children never receive vaccination. It's part of the fact that there has been, in, I'll give a lot of examples about Nigeria because that's uh, we are, are very familiar with the healthcare system in Nigeria. It's only recently that polio was said to have been eradicated. In spite of the fact that the campaign has been on for vaccination of children, usually when you give birth to a child, the vaccination schedule is, um, is, is uh, issued and the, which is supposed to be followed. In spite of that, you still have people, uh, children, people by polio. Why? Because the for some of them, it is, it is the accessibility. For some, it's the lack of education. For some, it's like we are having for COVID vaccine, it's vaccine hesitancy. And there, there has been a lot of myths associated with uh, uh, COVID vaccines. And that is why, uh, as pharmacists, we have a major role to play. And there's a need for us to, to develop strategies that can improve vaccine uptake and uh, by addressing some of the barriers. As you know, pharmacists are those healthcare, uh, uh, part of the healthcare system, the healthcare professionals that are often the most accessible. And uh, over the years, pharmacists have been said to be the most trusted healthcare professional. Why? We are in every community, especially for community pharmacies. You can, when you travel a few, meters, a few kilometers, you'll find a pharmacy, even in the rural area. And we have established competencies for many aspects of medication management, such as taking medication history, counseling, managing medication related adverse effects. So they play a prominent role in promoting vaccination uptake. The pharmacist uh, have always played a role. Traditionally, pharmacists are in charge of, since the mid 1800s, pharmacists all vaccines in pharmacies, they deliver vaccines to physicians, they prepare antitoxins administration and also distribute vaccines. So that when, by the time um, they, they, of course, manage the, the vaccine supplies, but as we go to the 20th century, and you know, there's increasing population, more uh, diseases and things, uh, um, the practice began to evolve. Pharmacists began to play a role, important role as educators and promoters of vaccine uh, and uh, of vaccine services. And so the pharmacist functions as an advisor and you know, because of the distribution, because we, uh, you can, even in the rural area, you can have community pharmacies practice. They can facilitate and participate in national and global routine vaccination strategies. Because they keep record of immunization schedule, recommend specific vaccines to patients and provide patient counseling. Their pharmacists have also been involved. especially with some of the lessons we have. Pandemic is that we have seen patient. The benefit of uh, pharmacist involvement is that of convenience. Like I said before, you know, it's often convenient to find a pharmacy just around the corner. Pharmacies are also very accessible. You don't need to long queue of um, waiting for the hospital with so many other patients that have come. You have uh, a very accessible um, uh, um, uh, uh, a place where vaccines can be obtained so that the waiting time is reduced. This often encourages people to, um, to be vaccinated. And of course, availability and accessibility, so that they are often very convenient. Uh, they, they, they improve uh, pharmacists in, uh, assist in improving the public health by their providing health education to the patient. 
So these are some of the benefits. And in um, so many countries where pharmacists have been actively available, especially for administering of flu vaccine and some of the other vaccines that are necessary for uh, uh, in, uh, for the children, and then when the uh, when people are traveling, they have found that the uptake of vaccine has been very high because of the convenience and the accessibility. Okay. Well, the question is: Can pharmacists vaccinate? Many countries around the world have authorized pharmacists to vaccinate, especially those in community practice. So that it is not only in storing the vaccines alone, pharmacists can actually, with the right uh, with uh, training, become vaccinators. In the U.S. pharmacists have been trained to administer vaccine uh, vaccination uh, over the years, and since 1996, when the nationally rec recognized immunization delivery program was created, the American Association of Pharmacists have been actively involved in vaccination, and in about in the all the 50 states in the United States, pharmacists have been uh, uh, the pharmacist vaccinators are available. This practice have, has also been initiated in some other countries like South Africa, United States, United Kingdom, and so on. I, in Nigeria, we are still in the, that stage of trying to educate the both the government and the public on the need for pharmacies to be more actively involved rather than the normal um, uh, 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 traditional roles. In the, even in the immunization program in Nigeria, we still have pharmacists involved in uh, the routine immunization, especially in storage, distribution, and so on. In, uh, I want to give a US example, and that of the state of California where there's already a law in place that empowers, that authorizes pharmacists to initiate and administer vaccines, especially those listed under the routine immunization schedule. Okay, and it could be uh, a prescription for the, the even, uh, it could be as a result of a prescription from a physician sometimes they do not need a prescription. All they need to do is to adequately record and of course notify the patient's primary care giver. And the, of course, though, uh, sorry, yes, primary care uh, provider. And of course, uh, so that there's adequate record. And when, when I'm talking about the um, part of the uh, challenges, I will also highlight that. So what are the lessons that we can learn from the COVID pandemic? We know that the uh, COVID um, has, over the last one and a half years, we have been, um, we have faced a global challenge. And globally, uh, COVID has, um, COVID has uh, affected over 190 million people, okay? And over 4 million deaths have been recorded from the COVID uh, pandemic. And I, I think it's one of the highest uh, that uh, pandemic that the world has faced because it's like no part of the world is paid. And as that uh, the last count, uh, the global number of cases was over 3.4 million. That's an 12% uh, increase. And of course, like uh, Dr. Anish said, there, there's been a lot of uh, new variants. We have the Delta variant, and we don't know which ones that is still, um, um, which ones are still mutating. So because it's really, really, um, the rate of mutation is also very high. So, and, uh, the accumulate, so we have these uh, variants developing. So the rate of infection is still very high in spite of what we have. And we are currently in the midst of this worldwide trial that has changed the life beyond every other thing. For instance, um, two years ago, there were very few webinars 
But you can see now we are linking up from different parts of the world. Of course, there are some gains. There are some very, you know, some innovations that have developed in the midst of the trial. So, but the COVID pandemic has demonstrated that a pandemic can know no boundaries. As, or does not respect any national or international boundaries. Every one of us, from the head of state to ordinary citizen, we have borne a great uh, responsibility for our health and the well being of others. Because it's, it, with the pandemic, you have to try and ensure that we do not infect others. It has demonstrated to us the value of freedom. For like three, four months, we were on total lockdown in Nigeria. And the economy has almost collapsed. There's so many people have lost their jobs. And, you know, it has, you know, it has thrown the world into a different system. But what do we do? Until the first vaccine was developed, we were all in this state of helplessness. We couldn't go out. We we're not sure. You still have, you couldn't hold meetings and so on. But Vaccine has been known to be a very powerful tool. And when the vaccine was developed in the, the Pfizer vaccine in, on, uh, was released in, on 31st December 2020, people began to breathe a sign of relief. And now we have about eight uh, different vaccines developed. You can see the very the, 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 the new uh, the new ones, the COVID Shield, AstraZeneca, and then we still have so many others uh, uh, vaccines being developed. But these vaccines have now brought hope. It has brought relief. People can now go out uh, with, um, with um, at least while observing the protocol, but you are, that sense of danger is a bit reduced. Like Dr. Anish said, the, uh, the benefit of uh, the vaccine is that even when you have the infection, it is not uh, it is not really debilitating and you can easily get over it. So the vaccine has come, and uh, we thank God that we at least there's been some hope. And you can see the dates when they're born in January, uh, sorry, December, February, March, April. Then we have some in June, and newer ones are being developed. Okay. At least 13 different vaccines across four platforms have been developed and are currently being administered. And after, since the first vaccination program in December, uh, as at 20, July 24th, that was yesterday, there has been about 194 million, over 194 million cases and 4 million deaths, over 4 million deaths. But in spite of the fact that we have had the vaccine, the various platform of vaccines developed now for over six months, only 27.1% of the world has received at least one dose of the vaccine. And only 13.6% are fully vaccinated. So that in across the different uh, platform, you have only 3.8 billion doses of vaccine that has been administered. And now because of the, uh, um, because of the uh, education and the promotion, about 30 million people are now ad, uh, vaccinated every day. So that we discover, but we discover that in the developing and low income world, the rate of vaccination is very low. You have about just about 1.1%. This is a graph that shows the share of people that have been vaccinated. You can see Canada, United Kingdom, Spain, having majority of their population, up to 50%, over 50% of their population being fully vaccinated. But by the time you come to India, India is down. India is down here, where less than 10% of the population are fully vaccinated. I think it's about 7%. Seven, seven and look at my own dear country, Nigeria. It's actually about 0.7% are vaccinated, fully vaccinated. So you discover that with the um, developed countries, the vaccine uptake is, is more. Of course, the cost 
associated with vaccination is still uh, uh, occurring, the vaccines are still there. And then the distribution, you can see the developing countries are down, down, down. And so the crucial role that pharmacists have uh, played in these developed countries like uh, the US and UK is that pharmacies and pharmacists are playing a crucial role in administration of vaccine. In the US, pharmacies have been partnered to distribute and administer COVID vaccine to priority groups in a more efficient way. And one of the ways they have also used that in, uh, in, in the UK is that most of the high street pharmacies actually vaccinate. So you can, they can reach so many people. They don't need to go to uh, uh, the, the hospital or the primary health care centers before they can get vaccinated. So, and uh, they have been able to effectively take care of the elderly and uh, of course those people that are vulnerable, they were the first target. And within, uh, by mid-February, within a month, they were able to reach over 15 million people because they had more people vaccinated. And the other example I want to cite of the role of the pharmacist is in China, in Shanghai University, Dan University in China in Shanghai. The whole process of vaccination is monitored by a, cl a clinical pharmacist. So that the clinical pharmacists are you know, monitoring the safety, the efficacy. And of course, the, they found out that even though the safety of the inactivated COVID uh, vaccine is good, they still have to, you know, we are just gathering data. And we, it is only with this uh, required data that we can actually uh, have effective advocacy on the uh, safety. And of course, that will uh, reduce vaccine hesitancy globally. So the clinical pharmacists have played a significant role in achieving this. What are the benefits of va ph pharmacists vaccinating? You know, by the training, pharmacists have established competency for many aspects relating to medicines, medication care, uh, medication therapy, you know, uh, and of course, monitoring adverse effects. They have been advocates for medicine and preventive health. And then they are training of vaccine storage, administration recognition of adverse effects associated with vaccine. And of course, they are highly accessible. So in terms of benefits, we have a wide range of benefits that the pharmacists offer when we begin to vaccinate, okay? And of course, the patient is saved the long waiting hours. And there's been significant studies have shown that in, in countries where pharmacists have been involved in vaccination, there's been a significant increase in the rate of vaccination. The study showed about Fold increase in the number of those in, uh, uh, vaccinated, okay, with influenza, influenza vaccine. And uh, low, the, the lower vaccination related healthcare resources utilization, of course, the also allows the farm, uh, places the pharmacist at a very uh, important point. Uh, but, uh, important area. So, pharmacists. Have been essentially trained okay to engage in discussion with patients to prompt vaccines recommendation you know usually the pharmacies they will say is usually the last part of call and of course for most of them the most important part of call when you come to medication by the time you are giving the medication to the patient you have the opportunity of interacting with the patient where the pressure is less you can easily uh, the patient in, in during the course of your introduction uh, in your, your discussion you can easily introduce the need and properly educate the patient but because of the multiple location in the metropolitan and um, urban areas you have convenience i think i've mentioned that but there are so many challenges and barriers to pharmacies uh, vaccination and th some of these have been based on uh, uh, um, what as of, uh, what has been operating, especially in the last six months. We discovered that, in, uh, like I showed in the graph, in most of the developed countries, 
pharmacists that have been vaccinated. I have colleagues in the US, in the UK that have been trained as pharmacist vaccinator. Okay, but despite the, uh, the, the, the success, we still have issues, challenges that still has to be addressed. One is the, the reductional variability in laws governing pharmacist training requirements. And then uh, pharmacists are not recognized as uh, vaccinators. So that, of course, bring that and uh, because the you do not have the, uh, you, it's said to be in, a, uh, in the jurisdiction of another professional. So there is that barrier that has been created. Okay. And then the vaccine administration, of course, the type and cause of vaccine and to which cohorts of patients. There is that um, uh, sense that pharmacists do not keep the whole record. They do not have the health record of the patient. So they do not, because most of the time the uh, health patient, uh, the patient's record is not shared. Okay. And so there's that inconsistent um, and um, broken communication line between the pharmacist, the doctor, and other healthcare providers. Then, of course, uh, some of the barriers that have also been highlight, highlighted is the pharmacy reporting of vaccination service. You said, and uh, that pharmacists, when, when the vaccines are given at the pharmacies, that it is not properly reported. And of course, there's inconsistent compensation and re, uh, reimbursement. When pharmacies become involved, until we have this case of COVID, pharmacies were not remunerated. Okay. In Australia, there's also the, the fear of jeopardizing relationship with local doctors and primary care providers, and the inability to promote the service to consumers. So we have that uh, fear, you know, the, the government does not want to interfere. They don't want to look at, break the relationship between the doctors. And so it's, uh, with it, between the physicians, so it's, that, that hesitancy is there, okay? And uh, the barrier perceived also by the patient is also important because the patient also feel, oh, will my record be confidential? Will there be privacy? And then some of them have also expressed concern about the lack of space. So the pharmacy, you know, you have drugs uh, that are arranged and all that. There may not be enough space. And of course, concern related to uh, record keeping. And then that fear of having um, other associated costs. That when I go to the pharmacy to get uh, my vaccine, there might be some other associated costs, which may not be available. There's also been fierce opposition from medical associations some nurses association against pharmacists vaccinated. And uh, they believe that once pharmacists are allowed to vaccinate, then of course the power they have is reduced. But however, in reality, when we look at it, the kind of training the pharmacists go through and with the right uh, certification, the pharmacist is well positioned to administer vaccines. So that in addition to the role of um, storing, uh, um, uh, storing distribution and of course uh, counseling, the pharmacist can also play a role in vaccinating. And uh, in, like I said, in some parts of the countries, uh, in parts of the world, pharmacists are already being trained so that they get um, uh, certificates as pharmacist vaccinator, and this has greatly improved the, dist the, the, the distribution, especially when you look, look at the COVID vaccine. You know, the rate at which the COVID um, the pandemic has been spreading has been very fast. And it's as if um, with every passing day, in spite of the fact that you said uh, the rate of infection has gone, has gone down, you still discover that so many other, uh, uh, the infections is still raging. And there are so many people that have not been vaccinated. So the only way that I, you and I can protect ourselves is ensuring that as many people as possible are vaccinated. And these people are all around us. 
So as um as a pharmacist, we have a great role to promote uh, to, to 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 play. As promoters, we should promote the issue of vaccination. We should enlighten people. We have the reach. We have the trust of the patients. We have the trust of the people we serve. So we should ensure that as much as possible, the issue of uh, the uh, uh, vaccine, the COVID vaccine, is given wider publicity. And as from as a, uh, uh, we should also play a lot of role in advocacy. Okay, because we know that pharmacies uh, vaccination can save as a way of conclusion. Vaccination can save has saved millions of people and it can indeed save millions of people as a very cost-effective health intervention. And as pharmacists, our roles should be expanded to for pharmacists to uh, our roles should be expanded to permit pharmacists to play significant role as vaccinators. Nigeria uh, let me share a bit about uh, the Nigerian case. Like I said, uh, the only about I've had only about three million doses of the vaccine, and out of that three million, uh, only about a one 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 million over a million people have been fully vaccinated, out of a population of two hundred million. You can see that that percentage is very low. And where the vaccines are distributed, the uh, vaccines are obtained only in the primary healthcare centers and some hospitals. So the uh, pharmacists have not been given that uh, uh, exposure. And uh, over the last three months, we have engaged in serious campaign and advocacy, first with the, with the government, and then with the patient, because we have a number of national health, uh, uh, na national immunization program, the same program that has been used to reach people for uh, measles, for uh, tetanus, for diphtheria, for cholera, and so on. But we discovered that that system has even over the years become ineffective. What we have really benefited from is that is the fact that over the years, with the consistent vaccination, the rate of infection has greatly reduced. But in a case where you have a pandemic that has been raging, there's the need to put get all hands on deck. And including pharmacies as vaccinators will, uh, will more broadly help to reduce the barrier that is related to the vaccine as accessibility of course, improve the overall vaccine coverage. We have pharmacies, even in the rural areas, where you have very small villages. Usually, what uh, uh, the concept that has been promoted over the years is the concept of um, of uh, satellite pharmacies, even where you do not have primary health centers. So part of the things that have impaired, uh, caused the problem with the distribution and the vaccination in Nigeria, especially for COVID, is that the designated primary health centers are not easily accessible. Okay, and this has created a lot of barriers for uh, va vaccination. And I'm sorry. Okay, the challenges and barrier um, barriers for pharmacy vaccination are multi Bacteria. We need effective strategies to uh, uh, address them. Overcoming these barriers will improve the increase the role of pharmacists as vaccinators. That ultimately will increase public access to vaccination, accurate and reliable information about vaccines. Because the misconception, in fact, in Nigeria, some people believe, oh, if you take the COVID vaccine, it will affect your fertility. You will not have uh, children. They said the vaccine is meant to reduce the global population. So there has been a lot of misconception. Like uh, Dr. Anish, I think he showed us a graph, uh, sorry, a, a, a figure where we have those that are opposed to vaccine uh, vaccination. And 
Unfortunately, the voices of those opposed to vaccination, anti-vaccinators are, you know, they are loudest. And they keep every day, they come with new, uh, 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 new, new, new reasons why people should not go to the vac uh, take the vaccine. But we know as pharmacists, because of the reach, our reach and our spread, we can actually play a very significant role in promoting vaccine uptake. I want to thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you. Over to you, moderator, Dr. Lins. Thank you, ma'am. Am I audible? Yes. Am I audible? Yes, ma'am. Yes, you are. We can hear you. Okay, okay, ma'am. Thank you very much for providing such an information talk, ma'am. Some questions are posted by the audience in the chat box. I'll read some questions. Uh, the first question which is posted by Dr. Sadir sir uh, is, many countries have not recognized Covaxin as, a, as well as Covishield. That's a limitation for many people to travel into those countries. How can we get over this regulatory issue? Those who took Covaxin cannot go to any countries now. Ma'am? I didn't get the question. The, the question is, yeah, the question is okay, that, you know, I can see it. Countries I can see. not recognize Covaxin as well as Covishield. This is a limitation for many people to travel into these countries. How can we get over this regulatory issue? Those who took Covaxin cannot go to any countries now. Okay. Uh, um, I think it has to do with the country regulation. And that is why it's important for us to do a lot of advocacy so that some of these um, regulations can be reduced. Like um, one of the misconceptions is that some uh, uh, will believe that some particular vaccines are more, um, are more effective. For instance, in Nigeria, the only vaccine we have so far is the AstraZeneca vaccine. We are still expecting the we're told that we will also have the, um, the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. So, you know, the, each country have their own regulation, but the most important is that we also have to, as pharmacists, we have also have to do a lot of enlightenment, especially our government and policymakers, because some of these regulations they make are really not, um, do not favor uh, the, the international connection that we all have. Thank you. Okay, ma'am. One more question from Dr. Sadesh Kumar. Death due to TB, kidney damage, and other commodities are need to be very high in this pandemic. Data which I, ha I had a mix of many, and the actual number of fatalities should be manifold than the reported case. Governments are trying to suppress the number of deaths from COVID. How can we overcome the situation? Shall I read again, ma'am? Yeah, yes, I know it's okay. Um, we know that, uh, let me use the example of what has happened in Nigeria for you with, uh, to answer this question. When, um, when COVID started and the, the lockdown started, every sickness, you know, Nigeria is a malaria endemic area. Okay, it's, uh, it's normal for you to, once you get infected, uh, you get bitten by mosquito, you can develop fever, you have all the symptoms. And incidentally, those symptoms are similar to that of COVID. Okay, because you begin to run high fever and all that. So we discover that for the first three or four months into the lockdown, a lot of people were dying, why? Immediately they go to the hospital and they present these symptoms. They are treated as having COVID. So a lot of other diseases have now uh, suffered because some patients on uh, medication, on uh, pro with co chronic illness, on long-term medication, they stop taking their medication. Of course, we all know that there was uh, global uh, uh, drugs uh, insecurity. There was no supply. They stopped taking their medication. So the comorbidities appear to have gone up and spiked. And uh, they, for instance, there was a 
one, one of the mother of one of our students was a known diabetic. Okay. Unfortunately, she had, uh, because she didn't comply with her medications, she had hyperglycemia and, you know, they rushed her to the hospital. The hospital did not admit her. They didn't even touch her. They said, go and bring your COVID test results. Meanwhile, in Nigeria, for you to take a, get a COVID result will take about, at that time, was going to take about for more than 48 hours. And the test center, the testing centers were not available. So she was not admitted. But of course, she ended up, she died from that. She died within, in, in less than 48 hours. Not because she had uh, COVID, but because the other comorbidity, the, uh, the, the diabetes that she had was not properly managed. So we see that a lot of, because of that misconception, a lot of our, uh, the, 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 a lot of the deaths that were recorded, even for COVID, were not due to COVID, but to other comorbidities. But because the pandemic was on, even the medical personnel were afraid. In fact, in a particular hospital, there was a, a, a period more than 30 doctors had COVID. So every other person just stopped coming to the office and they stopped attending to patients. So that may be responsible for the spike in the numbers of uh, in the number of people that died from the comorbidities, with uh, from the uh, kidney failure, TB, and so on, because they were not being treated. Those that had regular clinics where their health is being checked, they could not go to the clinics. So it, I think it's just a complicated and a multifaceted uh, problem that the COVID pandemic presented to us. I hope I've answered that question. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Ma'am, one more question. Uh, Ms. Ms. From Ms. Anida K. She would like to know how safe are COVID vaccines for pregnant women? She would like to know how COVID okay. vaccines are safe for pregnant women. Uh, presently, there are no data to support the safety. As you know, like uh, we were discussing, I said uh, part of the reason for uh, the hesitancy, vaccine hesitancy, is that the development was too rapid. It was too fast. People ask, are you sure that all the um, analysis were being done? Are you sure of the safety? The fact is we do not have data. And that is why, as pharmacists, we have an important role to play in recording the adverse effects that are that are, that are observed. And, you know, some of the other things we should be able to mean is not yet certain because, of course, you know, the vaccine that was developed within six months and all that there will be a lot of things that are unknown. I think in another year, maybe we'll have more information. Thank you. Okay, ma'am. No more questions. Any questions from the audience? So I'm going to conclude the session. Let me conclude the session. Hi. Any more questions from the audience? I think they are good. I find no questions from the audience, so I'm going to con conclude the session. Yeah. Thank you, ma'am, for providing a well versatile knowledge about the topic. On behalf of IPGA, my sincere thanks to Professor Oliver Toyn for giving an accurate and reliable information about the vaccination to, to all the participants. As it is relatively new, but the concept has been a part of healthcare, the benefit of pharmacists' involvement in vaccination. Ma'am has explained about the strategies needed to improve vaccine uptake by addressing major barriers to accessing and receiving vaccines. She also explained about the challenges and barriers for pharmacists in vaccination. Thank you, ma'am, for accepting our invitation and giving a strong and deep information about the topic. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you very much. It's Thank been you, a pleasure for me to be part of this. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am. 
That was really inspiring to hear from such a dedicated and knowledgeable frontline pharma professional who is here to educate the pharma community of India despite of the time zone differences and all. Much respect, gratitude and love from all Indian pharma community to you, ma'am, Professor Olivatoin, for your great time, effort and the very valuable knowledge. Thank you so much, ma'am, and wishing you all the success. And I would like to thank Dr. Limsi, ma'am, for the efficient handling of the session. Thank you so much, ma'am. And I'm kindly requesting all the participants to fill the Google form link provided in the chat box to avail your e-certificate for the participation. So, and finally, anybody, I don't know if anybody wants to speak, uh, if you want, you can permit, if it's so. Okay, sir. Jaggi, sir, is there, sir? Yeah, Jaggi, um, sir, you can have a word. Can mute. Please, please. Can't hear you, sir. Can't hear you. It's not working now. Thank you, sir. Can't hear a noise in your voice. I think the connection is uh, loose. Of your uh, well, have. mic, yeah. Now it's okay. Now okay. Okay. Uh, I just want to thank you uh, for giving me a few moments. Uh, both these sessions were very very informative, and uh, really, uh, I think many of the participants who were attending the both the uh, webinar, they must have gained a lot of knowledge, and particularly the second one, the role of pharmacists in vaccination. Uh, in our India also, we must uh, put pressure on our government also that they should be also be allowed and given the permission to uh, participate in such programs, which are definitely very, very useful for the community at large. And the first one, uh, what Dr. Anish was telling about, was also very informative. He had dealt with in great detail about how and uh, 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 the different uh, types of vaccines that are being manufactured. And uh, I feel proud that he, he is from India and at a place where he has been able to give knowledge to all our participants. And uh, I once again congratulate uh, the Kerala branch of IPGA for having invited such uh, uh, eminent uh, speakers. They were very, very useful. Thank you and good day. Dr. Deshagar. Anybody else uh, can have a word? Yes, no, I think no, I mean, thanks. nobody is. Uh... Yeah, what is Okay, sir. Finally, we are at the end of today's session. And now I request Dr. Jini EJ, Executive Member, IPGA Kerala Branch, to deliver the word of thanks. Jini Madam is working as Principal, Famous College of Pharmaceutical Sciences and Research, Varikoli, Aragula. Madam has completed her graduation and post-graduation from her alma mater, Sri Ramakrishna Institute of Paramedical Sciences, and honored with a PhD from Anamala University. Madam is a respectful former professional who is having 19 years of teaching experience and a life member of IPGA and APGI. She has published several articles in various reputed journals of the international status. It is my fortune to invite my beloved teacher, Dr. Jeannie EJ, to propose the vote of thanks. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you, sir. Am I audible? Yes, ma'am. Respected chief guest, speakers of today's session, and other dignitaries. Very good afternoon to one and all. Amid COVID-19 pandemic, pharmacists are globally providing services as frontline warriors that highlight the role of pharmacists in patient care. This seminar has been a great success as it imparted a lot of knowledge to all. On behalf of IPGA Kerala branch, I extend a warm greeting to our most valued guests honorable and respected IPGA members, esteemed delegates, 
for their presence and contribution to make this webinar a grand success. Today, I take this opportunity to put all my gratitude in the form of words, and it is indeed a great privilege to propose a word of thanks on this eminent occasion. First of all, I would like to express my heartfelt gratitude to our chief guest, Dr. Adul Kumar Nasa, National President, IPGA, Drugs Controller and Licensing Authority, New Delhi, for his valuable presence in today's webinar and for giving an inaugural address. Thank you, sir, for delivering such an interesting and thoughtful speech. I'm confident that your suggestions have been noted by all the participants. I'm grateful to Dr. Sajid C.I., Vice President, IPGA Kerala Branch, Professor and Vice Principal, Grace College of Pharmacy, for delivering a remarkable welcoming address. I would like to express our sincere thanks to Dr. Anish Chakungal, Principal Scientist and Team Lead, Analytical De Development and Bioconjugation, Janssen Vaccines, Netherlands, for giving an excellent coverage on the topic, role of pharmacists in developing versatile anti-pandemic vaccines, and for providing us with a great overview of the topic and making the session very attractive. Mr. Rengish C, Vice President, IPGA Kerala Branch, Assistant Professor, College of Pharmaceutical Sciences, Government Medical College, Alapura, deserves special recognition for moderating the session led by Dr. Anish Chakungal and assisting the host and speaker. Thank you very much, sir. I want to express appreciation to Professor Oliver Toyn A. Odeku, Dean, Faculty of Pharmacy, University of Ibadan, Nigeria, for your inspiring presentation, the depth of understanding and your ability to present the topic, pharmacist's role in vaccination, lessons from COVID-19 pandemic in such an interesting way. We are grateful for the time and effort you took to share your views and experiences at the event. A special mention to Dr. Limsi Tambi, IPGA member, Associate Professor, Chemist College of Pharmaceutical Sciences and Research for moderating the session led by Professor Oliver Toyn A. Odeku and offering her support to host and speaker. Thank you. I wish to express my gratitude to executive members of IPGA who have inspired us to do our best and are always stand us as a pillar of power to the success of our initiatives. I would like to acknowledge special thanks to alumni of Chemist College of Pharmaceutical Sciences and Research, Ms. Sonia Benny, PhD scholar, Department of Pharmaceutical Chemistry and Analysis, Amrita School of Pharmacy, Amrita Vishwavidya Pidam, Ernakulam, for the smooth conduct of this scientific session. I express my gratitude to all delegates of the pharma fraternity from various sectors like academics, industry, research, especially to IPGA Kerala branch members who have always been the backbone of NTVA. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ma. Once again, I thank all of you for your valuable participation and patience throughout this session over all the technical concerns of the virtual platform. I hope this virtual learning experience made all of you more knowledgeable on the COVID scenario and inspired you all to be the committed professionals, frontline heroes, and the COVID barriers. Let's hope to meet more frequently with many more webinars to update ourselves and to be the better versions and the better professionals of ourselves. Signing all once again, it's me, Sonu Benny, signing off. Let's all stand for National Anthem. Janagana mana adhinayaka jayahe Bharat bhagya vidhata Punjab Sindh Gujarat Maratha Dravida Utkala Vanga Vindya Himachal Yamuna Ganga Utchala Jaladhi Taranga 
तव शुभ नामे जागे तव शुभ आशीष मागे गाहे तव जय गाथा जन गण मंगल दायक जय हे भारत भाग्य विधाता जय हे जय हे जय हे जय 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 हे थैंक यू ऑल वंस अगेन स्टे से ओके थैंक यू एवरीबॉडी thank you thank you rajesh sonu shit shit then everybody thank you sir yeah and we'll have another we'll be in the meantime shortly we'll have another meeting le another so say the academic institution can think of the next one shortly yes sir plan jia yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay okay sir okay thank you thank you all Yeah. Thank you. And Belvatian, uh, madam. Ah, yes, madam. Belvatian, madam. She is sitting on mute and. Uh... La, left side. Okay. Left side. Okay. 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 Then. Okay. Sir. Okay. I'm going to work. Let me put a mail to them. Let me put a mail and certificate to them. Yes, sir. Put a mail and certificate to them. Yes, okay. Okay then. Thank you, sir. Okay. Bye, bye. Thank you, sir. Thank, thank you. Sir. Bye. Bye. -bye.